Good morning, uh, everyone. It is May 12th. It is 9 a.m. Uh, you are zoomed in or are zooming into the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission uh, weekly meeting, uh, which begins at 9 a.m., which was right now. Um, we're allowing folks to enter our meeting. Um, as folks do that, um, we will um, initiate this with a roll call. Hearings Manager Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Bo. Here. Commissioner Gonzalez. Here. Commissioner Hackett. Here. Commissioner McGowan. Here. Commissioner Mesner. Here. Commissioner Nanjapa. Here. Commissioner Robbins. Here. Mr. Chair, you have seven out of seven commissioners present. Great. Uh, welcome everybody. Good to see everybody today. Uh, we um, start today off with general public comment. Um, a couple of notes for the record. Um, uh, Director Julie Murphy is attending a conference this morning and is not with us. Uh, we will have um, Scott Cuthbertson, the Deputy Director, with us if we have any questions. Uh, we have a jam-packed uh, meeting this morning. We'll do public comment. I believe we've got nine folks signed up. Um, and then we will have a uh, presentation on Geology 101, first from staff and then from an industry panel um, from all parts of Colorado, which I think will be helpful for all of us. Um, we then will go into an executive session to receive legal advice concerning variances. Um, so that's the day that we have before us. Um, before we move into public comment, uh, I did want to make a statement concerning public comment. Um, and before I do that, I will note that we have nine people that have signed up. We also received written public comment from four individuals. Marie Venner uh, linked us to a report on methane and climate change. We had uh, specific public comment from Jason Brown and Joyce Lisbon. And then we had a uh, public comment from Alan Thabit with a link to an article on green energy transition environmental costs. So again, we really encourage the written public comment. It gives us a chance to follow the links to whatever you may want us to uh, look into um, and to read at our leisure, your public comment. Um, we do also uh, allow for oral public comments. And um, in that regard, um, I have a few comments. With regard to public comment, we ask that all public comment be civil. Civility refers to the way people treat each other with respect, even when they disagree. We acknowledge that the issues we engage in undoubtedly cause disagreement with our stakeholders. We ask that you speak with integrity, honesty, responsibility, respect, self-discipline, and yes, even compassion. We ask that you abide by the principle of civility, that is respect for others. This public comment forum is not a place to engage in personal attacks that disrupt our meetings against neighbors, against each other, against commissioners or staff. So with self-discipline and respect, we look forward to hearing from you and ask that you keep your public comments civil with these attributes in mind and that you maintain your public comment to three minutes. So, with that in mind, um, we will turn to public comment. Um, I'm running the clock. We have three minutes per person. And I would look to uh, hearings manager Larson uh, for the first person that signed up that is within our meeting. Yes, Mr. Chair, that is Janice Hallowell and we will bring Ms. Hallowell into the meeting. Okay. Are you there? We're there. We can see you and we can hear you, Ms. Hallowell. Okay, I'll start now. Hello, good morning, and thanks for opening this inquiry into abandoned wells and your intentions to get them plugged. Well, the Biden administration wants the plugs in the wells, and the people want the wells plugged. And one week ago, the U.S. House of Representatives voted in favor of H.R. 2415, the Orphaned Well Cleanup and Jobs Act. This bill was introduced by Teresa Ledger Fernandez, the representative from New Mexico, and it is co-sponsored co by our own Colorado representative, Diana DeGette. 
it has a pretty good chance of passing the Senate too, because it turns out even Republicans want the, wall, the wells plugged. The bill will provide federal support for plugging abandoned wells, but it leaves as it must much of the responsibility for cleaning up the wells in the hands of the states. Colorado is leading this positive legislation for well cleanup. I believe it is only right that the state and the commission step up and provide a clear plan to get the job done. Let's at least match the intentions of HR 2415 and work together to plug these wells safely and lead on best practices for, for plugging abandoned wells. So much goes wrong in the fight to save ourselves from climate disaster. We've made big mistakes. Letting oil and gas walk away from fracking and oil wells without properly plugging them is one. But it is one that we can correct and that is a positive. We all know that they must be plugged, but we have an opportunity here to build back better. HR 2415 supports carbon capture and sequestration in the plugging and remediation around the well pads. So why not plug the wells and also sequester carbon in them? We can do it. The technology is there. The support from Washington is there. Let's correct our mistake and build back better. The Well Done Foundation is testing plugging wells in Montana using biochar as an aggregate in the concrete. We need to run pilot wells testing the premise here too. Putting biochar and possibly other carbon sequestering materials into the plugs allows us to not just plug wells, but to take steps to correct our past mistakes and capture carbon at the same time. We can do this using the carbon capture and sequestration credits that are available. Please appoint someone to analyze ways to use this new industry of carbon credits, not with the intention of bailing out the oil and gas industry, but to help the state of Colorado, the taxpayers of Colorado, to pay for the $8 billion invoices coming due to plug these wells. I'm available to discuss these subjects in more detail if you wish. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hallowell. Um, that was constructive material. And I, I see that you were reading from perhaps uh, prepared remarks. If, if you wanted to email that to me or to Ms. Larson, we can get that to commissioners. I, th I think it would give us a chance to uh, look more detail into some of the points that you made. Okay. Um, we really appreciate that. And, and when you do the email, if you could uh, let us know your email in case any of us want to get back to you, we really appreciate it. Thank you. How do I uh, find those emails? Uh, Jeff.robbins at co.state.us. Two Bs and Robbins? Two Bs. I'm not a bird. <laughs> uh, at, uh, what is it again? At state.co.us state.co.us okay thank you i'll do that great and i'll get it to the, my fellow commissioners so thank you very much thank you miss larson who's next next up we have marie venner um good morning commissioners um i used to be a commissioner too and uh, I have spent my whole career serving the public in various ways. And uh, I know that you must realize that you are public servants too. Um, you're here to serve the public um, and not industry. Um, I asked last week um, how you're, you know, these are, this is a new thing, right? Having uh, full-time commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Robbins mentioned this a couple weeks ago that you're there all day and it really invites the question um, um, which I I guess I will have to use my time for you to answer uh, of how how your time is distributed as commissioners who wants to go first <laughs> I'm sorry Ms. Renner we don't do Q&A with folks we listen to folks and then if we feel the need to get back to them, we will do that individually. Okay, I, I asked several questions last week and, and I haven't heard back. You know, what I'm hearing this morning is that you are allocating special time to hear from industry, but you're not, you're not allocating time to hear in-depth presentations from experts. You know, for instance, I've done 50 National Academy studies. These are for all 50 states for infrastructure um, and environmental and uh, but mainly, 
mainly infrastructure agencies on process improvement. Um, and I know that there are a number of uh, experts and professionals. I, I don't see any sort of equity here in either how you're spending your time or how the, the presentations that you hear are, are distributed. And I pose questions in, in public comment and, you know, uh, it's, it's like they go in the dustbin or something, you know, it's like, okay, checkbox, we've heard, you know, we, we sat through the public comment. Um, you know, I've spent a year and a half testifying before the Air Quality Control Commission and helping frontline communities have a voice there. I've been in front of you less often. Um, fortunately, others have, have been, you know, stepping forward to serve in that way. As you heard last week, this is not something people do for fun. You know, personally, I came directly from the dentist this morning. My, half of my face is still numb. You know, this is something that people have, have taken a lot of time uh, to do. It's somewhat of a privilege to do. It's hard, you know, I had a time of my life where I was working three to four jobs at a time. You can't do that, this. You can't show up for this sort of thing. Um, but every Coloradan breathes our air. Um, you know, we were promised large uh, reductions in pollution uh, by 2025 um, from this sector. And personally, as someone who has worked for the public my entire life, Commissioner Robbins, I find your comments this morning very offensive, very offensive. You know, people are talking about their desire to breathe, for their kids to breathe. They are here for, I, I just read more research this morning about how heart attacks are more common near fracking wells. And, you know, for you all to have the audacity to imply that the kind, I know the kind public servants, you know, who show up diligently are, you know, uncivil, uh, you know, uncompassionate, that they should have compassionate for you who are paid to make sure these reductions get done and who are allocating all this time for industry. You know, it's like you're protecting the 1% over the 99%. And it's really from one public servant to another, from one commissioner to another, that is not right. And I personally, Mr. Robbins, think you should apologize. Excuse Thank me. Thank you. We're well over time. I will ask that you email me specific questions if you want us to respond to specific questions. And I ask that you next time pay attention to the time. I, I, I don't have, there's no timer in front of me. I will um, I gladly resend the questions I asked you all last week and repeat it today. Okay? If I need to send it in writing so you have it a third time, I will do that because I think the public deserves to be able to hear that. It's not an unreasonable request. And it's a request from the public anyway. Thank you, Ms. Benner. Ms. Larson, who's next? Up next, we have Shana Oliver. Hello. Hello, Ms. Oliver. We can see you and hear you. We look forward to hearing from you. All right. Thank you. Good morning. I would like to remind everyone that you are on stolen lands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, you, including 45 tribal nations that also have ancestral ties to Colorado. My name is Shana Oliver. I'm a Northeast community member of Denver, um, as well as an Indigenous Peoples' Rights Advocate. Um, field organizer for Equal Madres Moms Clean Air Force Colorado. Um, we are moms, dads, and caregivers who care deeply for all children's right to breathe and to play in a safe environment. Colorado is now the 10th worst, or it was the 10th worst um, state for air, air, um, poor air quality for um, ground level ozone. 
um, according to the state of the air report by and given um, by the American Lung Association. This year, the report came out that we are now eighth in that, and our air has not improved since Polis has took office. Over 4,000 oil and gas permits have been approved, and since then, in recent um, this year, we've learned that um, that air quality permits are not being taken with Clean Air Act rules and even prior to the changes um, during Trump's administration with um, quality assurance and air quality, that this was already happening and was already um, something that was alerted to, the, to, to many people that oversee air permits on pollution and things tied to Clean Air Acts. It really begs the question where the professionalism in giving out permits when over 4,000 permits have been issued before our climate bills passed for safety and health before your commission changed its mission to protecting and serving the people and the environment. We are in dire straits. People are being rushed to, the, to ER for asthma attacks. People are having to miss school and work due to poor air quality. And because of the negligence that happened during um, that administration, People are unemployed. People have been laid off. People have been promised that there will be jobs in oil and gas, but that still comes short of all of our communities. It is not something that we are in dire need of because these exports don't serve the need only once. And that there is really the true fraudulent connection of Oliver, this continuous system of genocide that started with the Indian Removal Act. This genocide continues through policy violations. It has run a long historic impact on our community's health, wealth, and environmental well-being. So I asked you to please deny all oil and gas permits. There's no need. You approved over 4,000 already. Stand by your leadership and actually protect the environment and health of the public and community over, over industry. Thank you. Ms. Larson, who's next? Next up, we have Patricia Oliver, or I'm sorry, Patricia Nelson. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm getting my timer. Hold on. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. So something happened over this last week um, that was very, very surprising to me. Um, for the first time in over four years that I've been doing this, I had a commissioner reach out to me, which I really, really appreciate. Um, I wasn't going to testify today, but that really inspired me to reach out to you all again, um, to invite you once again to come to my community to see the impacts of the decisions that you all are making every day. Um, I am more than willing to accommodate like a virtual visit or take time off of work and bring you guys down during the week, um, especially because school is about to let out in a couple of days or in about 10 days. And so there would be, I would be able to take you guys out to my son's school um, because the kids won't be there. So it would be okay for us to visit during a weekday um, because I understand that you guys um, are working and um, I mean, it would make sense to make that part of your workday, you know, to see what the impacts of your job are doing. Um, and then I also wanted to see, um, I guess I'll reach out individually um, to see what times work for you. Um, 
and just kind of really get the ball rolling on that. Um, and then also I'd like to try to figure out who we need to speak to, to, in my mind, <laughs> this should already be a part of your job description that you guys do site visits. Um, and so just to let you all know, I am going to be working on that. I don't know who I need to speak to, but I really want to make that part of your job description and make that a requirement that you guys are required to visit communities that are impacted again by your decisions. Um, and that's really all I have to say today. Um, I would also like to maybe ask if I can get your support um, in reaching out to CDPHE because they have removed the one camel unit they had at my son's school and they are not returning that after it's after maintenance is done. Um, even though we already know that there are have been recorded levels of benzene. Um, that were originally reported at 9.27 parts per billion, but then quietly CDPHE re-released the information showing that it was actually over 14 parts per billion. Um, and so we'd really like to get that camel unit back out of the school. Um, if I can have your support in that, um, I will also reach out individually to each and every one of you to see if you guys can help me out with that. Thanks. Ms. Nelson, thank you for the comments. Um, the actually it's fortuitous that you speak to site visits um i as chair have a meeting tomorrow with the department of natural resources human resource uh person and um it is indeed to discuss whether and when we can do site visits under COVID 19 we've been under constraints to work from home and to not do site visits mm -hmm. but i think we're starting to see the end of the tunnel there um, and so I think that I speak for all commissioners that we would like to do uh, tours um, with all aspects of our stakeholders, including the perspectives that you and your constituents bring. Um, and so I would ask that you reach out to hearings manager Mimi Larson. Um, okay. And I, looking at Mimi, but I believe her email is mimi.larson at state.co.us. We're all kind of state.co. I can find it. I know where to you look. Can find it on the website. And then Ms. Larson can work with our calendars as well as work with the policies that hopefully are going to start allowing us to do site visits because we've not been doing any um, uh, since COVID. Um, but I think that uh, in the upcoming months that that's gonna hopefully change and then we can get out and we do desire to do that. So thank you for the offer. Um, I'm glad that um, you were able to be with us this morning and to provide that presentation. Right, and like I said, I'm more than happy to accommodate and do a virtual site visit um, for you. I know that a lot of you don't exactly live anywhere near my community, um, you know, which can make it difficult and not as appealing to drive all the way to Weld County to do a site visit. Okay, um, again, reach out to Ms. Larson and we'll see what we can do in terms of getting stuff set up that's consistent with our, our policies. And if it is a, a virtual, then obviously we can all attend um, from a working from home and let you guide us um, with your cell phone or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Sounds good, work? thank you. Okay, great. And with regard to CVPHE, um, I would suggest you might wanna reach out to Commissioner Sean Hackett, who is mm -hmm. um, on the screen here uh, and is our liaison to um, CVPHE um, with regard to questions about use or non-use of the camel. Um, so again, thank you very much, um, Ms. Larson. Um, who do we have next? We have Ms. Renee Miller Chacon. Hello. Hello, Ms. Chacon. We can hear you. Good morning. So, I might testify on our suffering, but the responsibility really is on all of you to not allow a harmful normal, but something better because you do have the power dynamic to honestly influence our communities. Every time you allow outdated permits, there's blood in your profits. Our health is not something to compromise on for the sake of conceding for your economic benefit anymore. You truly have already shown community. You are no experts on our health for generations, but you will find any benefit to exploit for economic backing. This is environmental racism and targeting, but ultimately a blind, uh, policy making blind spot for our communities when it comes to authentic justice. How a moral and degrading it has truly become to, for year after year to have to compare our health benefits to your economic benefits when we suffer from 
so many forms of chemical cocktails brought on by benzene, hydrogen cyanide, and hydrogen sulfide. We are asking you, but we're honestly telling you at this point because we're being harmed. Reimagine how to dismantle all targeting practices of white supremacy and predatory capitalism, favoring some while harming those most at risk. It needs to happen now. Our pain should not be to this level of suffering. You do have the option to protect us, and we're telling you that your outdated systems, your outdated ways of providing even permits, and not a holding facilities accountable are now honestly erasing us on our own homelands. You do live on the land of the Ute, Arapaho, Cheyenne, Kiowa, Lakota, Hickory, Apache, Navajo, and 48 tribes that still travel through here. And yet, Suncor and CDPHE have been in the news this week for basing their permits on outdated memos. How do you think this makes you look to community? We do not have the power dynamic to change this policy making in the immediate future. You do. That's why we're asking you to honestly look at how this is influencing us with the legitimate protection now at this point. CDPHE is not responding to understanding that these permits are outdated and based on an old memo. We're asking you now to hold that responsibility. We already are on our painful suffering. And now, yes, this year alone, I've actually had seizures from anemia. That is possible from ITP anemia in our spaces. I've traveled for 10 years with my husband in the Navy and never had this issue until we came back home for the past four in Commerce City, breathing this specific air that has reactivated my anemia. My, no, my son now suffers with daily nosebleeds and my oldest is now suffering from a form of asthma. My children were military brats. They have never had this issue before until we came back home. I ask you to now protect future generations. This is a legitimate concern for more than just BIPOC generations and disproportionately impacted communities. Understand where profits are now becoming blood profits if they have not already been blood profits. I call them blood profits because they're honestly meant on a whole health, a whole economic benefit based on us conceding our health and our safety. If you would like to listen and reach out, do reach out to Spirit of the Sun. We do on the ground and frontline grassroots monitoring, and that's what we're asking you to do as well. There's a lot of communities on the ground that are doing this work. Please reach out to those where you are leaving us out and it's causing us to be left out of literally future generation survivance. Thank you for listening. Also, thank you. Next up, Mr. Chair, we have Tess Dougherty. Hi, Commissioners, can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Dougherty, we can hear you. Great, um, thank you, Commission, for allowing me to speak today about the impact of environmental negligence um, on people's lives. I'd also like to acknowledge that we reside on the stolen land of 48 indigenous tribes, which include the Arapaho, Ute, and Cheyenne. Um, we have a legacy of um, white genocidal colonizers who for um, years have we still we still currently occupy these lands and um, I don't think the results have been very positive. Um, I'd like to center us around this commission's rules as laid out in SB 19181 that are most relevant to this conversation. First is establish new regulatory relationships with local governments, which include your involvement early on in local permitting and siting processes and, include, um, and includes recognition that operate, operators must comply with the most protective regulations. Ensure environmental justice for ju disproportionately impacted communities and allow them to be involved in the permit process. In the fall of 2019, my husband and I were displaced from our home because um, of environmental factors. We had um, a fiberglass and they then, we had fiberglass insulation get into our HVAC system and we were pulling glass splinters out of our skin. Um, so we um, had to move and um, we are still not back in our house. Um, we've lived in 15 different places. We sheltered in place in uh, hotels and Airbnbs. We both got COVID and, um, and we, um, it is, you know, housing displacement because of environmental factors took a 
a really dramatic um, toll on our on our psychological, uh, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual well being. Um, and I, you know, I, I was a teacher for eight years in DPS before um, before really dedicating to environmental and housing justice because that's what is at the center of everything, um, and we experience that. Um, in regards to SB 200 um, and how this would impact real people like me and my husband. Opponents of the accountability bill include the oil and gas sectors, utility companies, and oddly enough, the governor who enacted the climate roadmap and called for the new laws to begin with. In all of Polis's objections, he has refused to offer a viable alternative solution. The lingering message appears that you know, we are to accept that, um, you know, there will be voluntary efforts over enforcement, seemingly making this, um, you know, like a no accountability, um, you know, uh, path that we're on. Our state modeling clearly demonstrates that we are not on target to reach our climate goals, despite police pol politely asking entities to do their part. If voluntary measures had worked, we wouldn't need to enforce emission caps in the first place. The same um, this happened when Polis lifted statewide COVID-19 mandates too early, stating Coloradans would do the right thing. Instead, it led our state straight to one of the highest case rates per capita in the United States, even as overall cases in the nation were on a decline. In March 2019, a study published um, found that white people experience an average of 17% less pollution than the production of their goods and services emit. In contrast, black people experience 56% more pollution than their consumption generates. Still due to, um, you know, so I, I think that we are, we're talking about holding people accountable, Valerie, holding companies up. Please wrap up. Oh, that was up. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that said 30 seconds left. Sorry about that. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to point out um, some of those things. And that's really all I had to say today. Um, I'll come back for more next week. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Larson. Uh, who's next? Next up is Mr. David Hagen. Good morning. Um, I had planned on speaking about some other stuff, but um, I'm going to tell you all the same thing I told city council when they asked us to be civil. Were you being civil when you allow or when the government allowed Suncor to pollute the air, which is killing our people? It's not, it, it's actually pretty disgusting to have somebody say something like that. Um, I don't understand where y'all come up with that as an idea to talk about civility. Um, when can, I, can I interrupt real quick? We're yeah. the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. We do not regulate Suncor. Okay, yeah. Okay. You, well, you, should, you, you, should, you should spend your time and go to APCD okay. and CDPHE. Okay, well, I'm gonna continue talking to you about civility for the moment. Um, that's there's fine, plenty I just of the record to reflect that that's not us. So, yeah, I, okay, I understand, understand that. that. That was just- a, Okay, thanks. You know what? I'm good today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next on our list, Mr. Chair, is Guillermo Cerna. I'm unfortunately not able to find Mr. Cerna in our meeting at the moment. Um, and he oh. generally finds us. We usually hear from him. So yeah. maybe let's go to Ms. Douglas, who also um, generally speaks to us, and then we can Look to Mr. Cerna uh, if we are able to find him after Ms. Douglas. And unfortunately, I'm not finding Ms. N Douglas either. Oh, here we have a phone number coming in. Yeah, Ms. Douglas usually attends via phone. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for recognizing me. Um, thank you again for allowing me to speak to you this morning. My name is Christy Douglas. I really don't have to go through my introduction again. You hear from me weekly, and you will continue to hear from me weekly. I, um, I serve as the co-chair for NRCC, and uh, we're just a group of volunteer citizens who recognize that we're a disproportionately impacted community 
and that we need to band together to protect ourselves and that DI community is Commerce City in Adams County. I also would like to comment on the opening remarks that you had today, Commissioner Robbins. Um, I want to let you know as a DI community and a mother of black children with a black husband, and I'm kind of used to hearing what you had to say this morning. Every time we come out and speak the truth, such as with Black Lives Matters, we are told to be civil. Know your place. Know your place because you're inferior. So therefore, you need to let us control the narrative because we know best, because we're superior. And we've got this. But I'm going to tell you from my experience, I know that you don't have this. You just tell us that to make us complacent. I am so tired of this being a double standard country, a double standard everything. The industry comes out and they can be totally hostile. I've heard them. I've heard them threaten to recall. I've heard them threaten to sue. I've heard them. I, I know people who have gotten death threats from them. They don't play fair and nobody else does. That's why we're here. And that's why we keep speaking up because the other side doesn't play fair. And when we speak up, we're called uncivil, savages. I don't get it. We have to stop pre pretending. I want to echo what Marie Venner said this morning. And then I would like you to take up Patricia Nelson on her offer, but I would like her to accompany you to the sites. I do not want you to do site visits on your own because you will be influenced by industry and they will show you their side of things and how great they're doing and how they have everything under control and how they just have to keep on drilling to meet their needs while we sacrifice. Thank you so much for your time this morning. I hope I was civil. Thank you, Ms. Douglas. Did we find Mr. Serna, Ms. Larson? I still do not see Mr. Serna in the meeting. Okay. Um, perhaps he signed up and then was not able to make it. Um, that concludes public comment. And um, with that, we will, return, we will turn to the several presentations on Geology 101. Uh, these have been organized um, by Commissioner McGowan. And so I'd like to call on Commissioner McGowan to sort of set the stage for us if possible. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> and I know for, for some of us, it uh, felt like we just got plopped down in the middle of mission change rulemaking and um, for me, I kind of wanted to go back and revisit the kind of the basics of Geology 101 for Colorado and how that interfaces with oil and gas development. And um, so as commissioners, we put together some questions. Um, Dave Andrews from our staff is going to give us kind of the background um, Geology 101 definitions that we hear a lot in our commission hearings like basin and field and formation and play and reservoir and how those all came to be, how it looks different around different parts of the state. And then we have um, some real life examples from different operators from Occidental and Karis and Kinder Morgan, Evergreen and the Energy Council to talk about what it looks like in the different basins and why um, what they extract might be different and how they extract might be different because of geology. And then the interface with um, um, the hydrology of the state was one of the questions commissioners asked. So I think um, Alec from um, Oxy is going to address that. And then um, without 
knowing what the future holds, we also um, asked folks if they thought they saw um, what, what the future might look like if formations that aren't accessible now might be accessible sometime in the future. Um, what do we think that looks like? And I, I think our folks thought, the folks that are giving presentations, I think might have some general answers, but no specific answers. Um, I've already learned a lot talking with them. Um, I think we're going to learn a lot today. Dave's going to kick us off and then each of the operators has 15 minutes and um, feel free to ask questions um, when they're done with their presentations. Thank you so much, Commissioner McGowan. I see uh, engineering manager Dave Andrews is with us. Dave, I think the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Robbins, and thank you, Commissioner McGowan, for um, introducing the topic. Um, let's see, do we have my slide deck yet? I can drive it from here. Give me a moment. Okay, do you all see the full screen or my notes version? We see the full screen without notes. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, good morning again, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today about one of my favorite topics, Colorado's petroleum geology. I'm Dave Andrews, the commission's engineering manager. My geological career started at Michigan Tech, where I spent time during a semester of summer field geology, swatting black flies and horse flies while mapping outcrops along creeks in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Little did I know that one day I would be living in the middle of the Peons Basin, looking across the Colorado River Valley at the Rhone Plateau. The photo on this slide highlights the cliff forming U Uinta Formation above the more gentle slopes of the Green River Formation. The red and tan Wasatch Formation lies at the bottom of the valley. Geology is full of definitions. We will start with the largest feature of interest to most petroleum geologists, a sedimentary basin. A basin is a collection of oil and gas fields in a bowl-shaped depression that may be tens or even hundreds of miles wide and a mile or more deep. The cross-section on this slide shows a slice through the denver julesburg or DJ Basin. The Front Range Mountains to the west on the left side of the diagram push the rock layers in the basin up upwards creating a source of rock for deposition of the sediments in the basin. Rock layers dip at a gentle slope as the right side of the cross section approaches the Colorado state line with Nebraska and Kansas. Wattenberg is an oil and gas field in the DJ basin between Denver and Greeley. The orange shading shows productive oil and gas reservoirs in, Rotten in Wattenberg field including the Niobrara, Codell, J-Sand, and Dakota formations. These sandstone formations and intervening shales were deposited long ago when Colorado was partially covered by an advancing and retreating shoreline along a shallow sea. For the second definition on this slide, the word embayment is used rather than basin for two small depositional areas in southeastern Colorado. This map of Colorado shows the locations of two major arches or uplifted areas. In the Northwest, the Douglas Creek Arch separates the Uinta Basin, which is mostly in Utah, from the Peance Basin. In the Southeast, the Los Animas Arch separates DJ Basin from the Hugoton Embayment. North Park Basin, the Eastern Colorado Basins, Canyon City Embayment, and Hugoton, Hugoton Embayment share many similar formation names. On the other hand, geologic formations and characteristics of the larger basins in Western Colorado have more in common with neighboring basins in Wyoming, Utah, and New Mexico. Sandwash Basin is contained to Colorado, but it shares characteristics with Washakie Basin to the north in Wyoming. Paradox Basin extends into Southeast Utah, and San Juan Basin is centered in New Mexico. Similarly, a significant part of Raton Basin extends into New Mexico. 
Colorado's other intermountain basins are not known to contain significant sources of oil and gas. With this group of definitions, we will decrease our geographic footprint from a basin to a play. Plays are groups of similar oil and gas reservoirs, commonly with a sing within a single basin. A field may have more than one reservoir rock with oil and gas. In this example, this is the Dakota, Cedar Mountain, and Morrison play in Northwest Colorado. It includes fields, which are shown in pink on this figure, near the northern, southwestern, and western margins of the Peons Basin. And it also includes fields along the north-south trending Douglas Creek Arch. South Canyon is an example of a field with three different reservoirs in the same field. I apologize for the typo here. This should be definitions part three. We continue to work our way down to smaller features. A pool is a discrete accumulation of oil or gas in a reservoir or rock. The accumulation in a pool is constrained by a structural trap, a stratigraphic trap, or a combination of the two that keeps the oil or gas within the pool. As an example, this is a simplified um, common structural trap, an anticline, which is a fold in rock layers where the oldest rocks are at the bottom or the core of the anticline. When a confining cap rock, typically a shale, is present, oil, gas, and water may migrate through the reservoir rock until it is constrained by the source rock, by the um, cap rock in a fold or a fault plane. Natural gas is lighter than oil, and oil is lighter than water. Uh, therefore, buoyancy stratifies the fluids into horizontal layers in the reservoir rock. The Peons Basin in Northwest Colorado is a basin-centered play. In this type of play, petroleum has not moved very far from the source rocks that are also interbedded with the reservoir rocks. Stratigraphic traps form as a result of changes in rock type or changes in porosity and permeability of the reservoir rocks. In this case, the Williams Fork Formation has lenticular sandstones interbedded with shale and coal. The left side of this diagram is a geologic time scale. Throughout most of Earth's Precambrian history, signs of life were sparse. Petroleum needs organic matter to form. Beginning in the Cambrian period, remains of plants and animals provided a source of organic matter. Production in Paleozoic era reservoirs occurs in the Hugoton embayment and parts of Western Colorado basins. In Mesozoic era rocks, Triassic and Jurassic reservoirs are more widespread throughout the state, but oil and gas production is more common from Cretaceous reservoirs overlying um, Cenozoic, or I should say underlying Cenozoic era tertiary reservoirs. Geologic time is an important component when petroleum forms in source rocks. As a basin fills with sediment eroded from nearby uplifts and highlands, the sediment, thickens, or sediment thickness increases towards the center of the basin. With sufficient time and sediment loading, the thickness uh, reaches several thousand feet, or as shown on the right side of this diagram, several kilometers. Below the surface, geologic formation temperature and overburden pressure increases with depth. Depending on the depth of burial and the resulting temperature and pressure increase, Water is expelled from the petroleum source rock and the kerogen derived from organic material in the rock cracks to form oil, natural gas, or both. This slide and the following two slides use a similar color scheme compared to the geologic time scale on the previous slide. From top to bottom, Cenozoic era formations typical for the selected basin in this case, we have uh, Peons Basin and DJ Basin are highlighted in green. Mesozoic formations are highlighted in yellow and Paleozoic era formations are highlighted in pink. Here we have two fields from Peons Basin on the left and DJ Basin on the right. Grand Valley Field 
has tertiary and upper Cretaceous reservoirs, whereas Wattenberg Field reservoirs are from the upper and lower Cretaceous periods. Formations with productive hydrocarbons are shown in green with a white X. Production in southeast Colorado is variable when it comes to geologic ages of the reservoir rocks. Cretaceous res reservoirs dominate closer to the mountains, particularly coal beds shown here in Raton Basin, but Paleozoic era production is prevalent where the Hugoton embayment extends into adjoining states southeast of Colorado. As with the southeast, oil and gas is produced from geologic ages that are different in the two main basins in the southwest. Paleozoic reservoirs dominate in the Paradox Basin, whereas Mesozoic reservoirs are common in the Ignacio Blanco Field in the San Juan Basin. San Juan Basin's largest gas reservoir is the Upper Cretaceous Fruitland Coal Formation in the center of the basin. There is also wide variability within the San Juan Basin as older production west of the Hogback and Red Mesa field um, is much different than the uh, more modern um, coal bed methane production in the main part of the Ignacio Blanco field. Prior to the 1950s, oil was collected from seeps in various parts of the world. In the late 1850s, the Colorado Gold Rush coincided with the start of oil well drilling in Pennsylvania. As gold prospectors climbed through Colorado's creek, creek beds and valleys, they found an oil seep above a Morrison Formation outcrop north of Canyon City. In the 1860s and 1870s, a new stimulation method using gunpowder and percussion caps was introduced in Pennsylvania, along with steam-powered drilling, uh, which aided new discoveries. In 1871, Isaac Canfield drilled the Florence Field Discovery Well. In the 1800s, three fields were discovered as drillers looked for seeps in shallow, naturally fractured shale plays. After Florence, the White River Field was discovered in Rio Blanco County, and the Garcia Field was discovered in Los Animas County. Backing up a bit to the 1860s and 1870s, members of the Canadian and Pennsylvania uh, Geological Surveys began to speculate about the nature and occurrence of petroleum in reservoir rocks. Thomas Hunt and Ebenezer Andrews, no relation, promoted the search for anticlines to find new oil fields. After some prompting from the Pennsylvania Geological Survey, drillers began to save their drill cuttings for further study, and they recognized the importance of geologic structure with a more intensive search for anticlines beginning in 1901. For oil and gas technology, the first three decades of the 20th century brought about changes in drilling, casing, and cement. Remote forms of sensing also began to develop with aerial photography and seismographs. Ford Motor Company, Company introduced the Model T, creating a new demand for petroleum fuel. The period from 1901 to 1925 brought new field discoveries in naturally fractured shales centered around anticlines. A Niobrara chalk play in Yuma County and the first two sandstone reservoirs in Colorado at Moffett Field and Wellington Field were discovered. The next two decades saw geologic breakthroughs, namely the recognition of non-anticlinal traps, carbonate reservoirs, and salt domes. Disciplines of geochemistry and micropaleontology helped develop knowledge of stratigraphy, petroleum occurrence in reservoirs, and correlation of geologic formations. Many cable tool rigs were phased out in the late 1920s, with rotary drilling rigs becoming more common. For drilling and completions, new technology included blowout preventers, new drill bits, the beginning of directional drilling, portable drilling rigs, perforating guns, and acid stimulation. Downhole electrical logs also revolutionized the way that operators collected downhole information. You will see that I brought back the blue basin shading on this map. During the period from 1926 to 1946, understanding of geologic principles developed and operators began to recognize that fields were concentrated in basins. As a result, many more fields were discovered. 
in the late 1940s through the 50s, the geological concepts emerged, new geological concepts emerged. Uh, natural gas was recognized as a valuable resource, the COGCC formed, and operators discovered hundreds of new oil and gas fields. This figure illustrates sedimentology in a nutshell. Geologists observe deposition in different modern day sedimentary environments to understand how past depositional environments affected formation of petroleum source rocks and reservoir rocks. Beginning in 1947, the introduction of hydraulic fracturing treatments was a game changer for the oil and gas industry. This period also brought the introduction of water floods for secondary recovery, deep drilling, downhole motors, computers, and, new and a new federal highway system. The 1960s through the 1990s were dominated by the formation of OPEC and the oil embargo in 1973 large fluctuations in prices from supply and demand pressure, and increase in offshore drilling, improvements in hydraulic fracturing treatments, and improvements in computer processing. This slide illustrates large swings in oil and gas prices, particularly from uh, the year 2000 to present. So far, most of our time has been spent on conventional oil and gas traps with some discussion of basin centered plays and a target unconventional place. However, let's not forget about coal bed methane resources, which may lie closer to the ground surface. As with oil and gas, coal requires time, burial, and heat to turn swampy sediments into coal. The coal quality increases with higher heat and pressure. Most of Colorado's oil and gas fields, including today's largest producing fields, were discovered or developed during the last 60 years. This includes fields in North Park, DJ Basin, including Wattenberg Field, Raton Basin, San Juan Basin, including Ignacio Blanco Field, and Piance Basin. Last, this slide shows horizontal field development, primarily since about uh, 2012. As you can see, horizontal well development is highly concentrated around Wattenberg Field and the DJ Basin. And with that, that is the end of my slideshow. Thank you, Mr. Andrews, for the slideshow. I think Ebenezer Andrews would be proud to have you as a relation. Um, that is a ton of information. I'm not sure where to begin with regard to questions. So maybe I'll look to Commissioner McGowan and set this up if she wants to start or if other commissioners have questions for Mr. Andrews. All right, uh, uh, Commissioner McGowan, yes? I don't have any questions but I did double dog dare Dave to show his Dr. Seuss geology book. When we were prepping for this meeting, he has this very large geology book about Colorado and oil and gas development. So I have no questions because Dave and I prepped and I feel like uh, he helped me through some difficult concepts, but I uh, thank you very much. It was a great presentation and I assume that we're gonna post this if folks ever wanna come back and look at it. Yeah, I um, would definitely suggest to Hearings Manager Larson and Hearings Manager Morrow that we get this posted to the website so that others can take a deeper dive into it. And Dave, I may be wanting to have a one-on-one -on -one with you to get further information after I've digested the information. So thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Sure, thank you. Any other questions from commissioners at this time? Okay, we're running a little ahead of time. Uh, Commissioner McGowan, do you know if the industry panel is ready to go? I think they are, Mr. Chair. Um, oh, sorry, what? I think Sean had his, I think Commissioner Hackett had his hand up. Oh, Commissioner Hackett, did you have your hand up? Sorry. Is yeah, sorry, I was a little late um, to raise my question. I did actually have a question for Mr. Andrews. Um, actually, kind of a question about laterals um, and I you know plan on asking industry this as well but do you know and I, I know this is something that varies from operator to operator basin to basin project to project but 
is there an average distance of laterals that operators are drilling these days? Um, I've heard maybe one mile, some are hitting two, some are hitting three. And I guess kind of what I'm getting at um, is, you know, with the new setback requirements um, and siting requirements and the mission change rules, as well as the revision in Senate Bill 181 that waste no longer includes the stranding of a resource if it's necessary and reasonable to protect public health and environment. Um, and there might be situations where operators need to push their technology or enhance their technology to go farther away. And just wondering what sort of where we're at now in terms of how long laterals are and what sort of geological limitations there might be in extending those out. Chair, may I? Yes, the thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hackett. Um, I, I will say that in part, uh, lateral length is dependent on technology and prices. So you probably saw a couple of slides uh, to that effect. Um, when prices are higher, um, I think they can push technology a little bit further um, and also depends on any new technology that's coming out. Uh, we've seen it being somewhat variable in um, DJ Basin and as you're probably aware, um, horizontals don't really come into play as much in some of the other basins. Um, but I think the DJ operators might be a little bit better equipped to um, answer that question on lateral length, other than my uh, generic points there. That, that's, help, that's helpful, thank you for that. Um, and then another question I had unrelated is, we get a lot of concerns um, about potential for earthquake related to oil and gas development. And I know Colorado has had some experience with earthquakes related to development, um, not nearly as much as Oklahoma, for example. And I'm wondering if maybe you might be able to speak to some of the differences in how operations are conducted here or perhaps differences in geology um, that might explain the different experience with earthquakes between Colorado and Oklahoma. Thank you, Commissioner Hackett. I I would say that um, I do recall during our UIC rulemaking, um, our Bob Kaler, our former UIC lead, went into great detail on how um, that is different in Colorado versus Oklahoma, um, primarily on the geology side. Um, I would hate to try and reinvent what uh, Mr. Kaler said, um, but I will say that there are differences. It is primarily uh, related to UIC injection as opposed to hydraulic fracturing. And I would invite anyone to go back and, you know, take a listen to that part of the mission change presentation. Thank you for that, Mr. Andrews. I'll, I'll go ahead and look back on that. Um, those are the, all the questions I had for you this morning. Thanks again. Thank you. Other commissioners with questions, Commissioner Nanjapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Andrews, for the uh, excellent presentation. Um, very informative. This is definitely an area that I um, am very much still learning, um, and so it was taking me a little time to process my questions with all the information that you provided. Um, looking at, you know, kind of the timeline that you provided, uh, it seems that, you know, it's, it's even in just the last couple of decades, we've uh, perhaps there's now technology that's available that allows the access of, of certain um, certain fields and maybe even newer ones that have been discovered. So um, is it safe to say that there are additional fields that are out there that just perhaps now are not accessible due to technology limitations? Or um, you know, are, is that kind of an ongoing process of discovery? Uh, and I, I'll ask the same question of industry as well, but I was just curious from your perspective. Thank you, Commissioner Nanjapa. Um, I, I would say that kind of in, in line with the response to my previous question, in part it depends on uh, the price environment, uh, but technology certain, certainly comes into play. I would say um, one thing that has improved uh, the uh, development of resources over the last decade or so has been uh, logging with drilling and measurement with drilling technology, which really allows the horizontal well operators to understand where they are within the formation as they're drilling 
um, rather than trying to figure that out after the fact through logging. Um, so I, I think that was another big game changer with industry. Um, just the ability to be able to stay within uh, the zone of interest for horizontal wells. Um, with regard to other plays around the state, um, I would say we saw a little bit of that back around 2013 or 2014. Uh, where we had some operators that were uh, testing out new horizontal wells in San Wash Basin and North Park. Um, for San Wash Basin, um, it did not really lead to substantial development, but it, it did so in, in North Park. Um, so that was an example where an operator may have uh, gone back, looked at um, old data, performed some seismic work, and determined that, um, hey, we might have a play here that may have been overlooked in the past. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. Other commissioners with questions at this time? Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. Um, when we talked about, or you mentioned kind of the, the discussion about uh, pools and, and a lot of the geology that, that we learned about today, um, see more on the conventional side. And I was curious how um, unconventional resource geology um, plays into that and, and specifically in the de definition of pool as we think about that from a pooling perspective um, as defining our rules. So for, thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez. Um, for the, the word pool, um, I would like some AG support on that because I know it does play into uh, the statute and um, how it's defined in the rules. Um, from an but from my you know, personal point of view with an unconventional play, uh, particularly the, the basin-centered plays that we have with uh, DJ Basin and Peance Basin, um, essentially it, it's a very large pool uh, that was inaccessible in, in those cases uh, prior to hydraulic fracturing. So I think that's one big reason why in the early days we saw lots and lots of smaller fields uh, but it really was around the 1970s and 1980s where we um, got into more of the uh, development drilling. So, I mean, once you have the uh, limits of a field uh, defined through exploration drilling, um, for the basin center plays, that was more of pretty much every well that you drill within that area um, would yield a, a positive result. Um, so I, I think that's where those larger plays and the basin center player plays had a, a big impact on production and uh, new drilling in Colorado. Any follow up commissioner Gonzalez? No, that's it. You know, I, um, I kind of really wanted just to highlight that the difference in the conventional um, geology and conventional drilling versus the, uh, the resource drilling that we see in, um, in the DJ Basin and uh, in some of the other areas. So appreciate that, Mr. Andrews. Looking to see if we have any further questions for Mr. Andrews. Great, Dave, again, thanks very much for the tremendous information. We'll get it posted. We'll all look into it in more in depth and perhaps reach back out to you individually. Um, and with that, I believe we are ready to bring the industry panel um, on board to speak to us about their thoughts on Geology 101. Um, that pretty much covers the state, so we'll look forward to hearing from that. Hey, good morning. This is Alec Duncan. Uh, let me just take a minute and get my slide shared here. I think you've got the wrong screen. Let me switch. Okay, how are we doing? Hi, Mr. Duncan, I think that looks good. We can see and hear you and we see your slideshow without notes. Excellent. All right, well, <clears throat> thank you very much for the time. Um, 
My name is Alec Duncan. I'm a geologist and uh, operations geology manager for uh, Occidental Petroleum. Uh, been in the industry about 15 years and um, been with um, Oxy, uh, previously Anadarko, since about 2011. And I've been working the DJ Basin um, pretty much the entire time. Um, so what we're going to try to do today is uh, give you a highlight on um, the introduction to the geology of the DJ and touch on the development history. Um, then talk a little bit about the groundwater protection and the rule changes. And I'll give you a high level overview of horizontal drilling and a geologist's role in making that happen successfully. So the primary oil and gas targets are all Cretaceous age rocks. So the map on the top left is uh, North America during the Cretaceous, about 85 million years ago with Colorado highlighted right there. Um, Colorado during the Cretaceous was a shallow ocean called the Cretaceous Interior Seaway. And over millions of years, the shorelines of the Cretaceous Interior Seaway moved back and forth as relative sea levels rose and fell and material was washed off the ancestral Rockies into the sea. The stratigraphic column in the bottom right is the modern day stacking of the rocks, older rocks on the bottom and younger rocks as you move up. Now the orange and yellow formations in the strat column are all sandstones. So these rocks are made up of sand sized particles washed off the ancestral Rocky Mountains and deposited into various environments within the seaway. The Codell sandstone is one of those primary horizontal targets. Now the gray units in the strat column are all shales or mudstones. These are the finest clay particles eroded off the Rockies and carried in suspension, deposited very far from the shore in the deep water. Now the blue colors are carbonate rocks. The carbonate rocks are a type of sedimentary rock composed of calcium carbonate grains. It's basically the remains of sea life, um, in some cases shells, coral reef, shark teeth, things like that. But in the case of the Niobrara, these are microscopic organisms living within the water column. The microscopic organisms really thrived in the Cretaceous Interior Seaway and their remains sank, carrying all the organic carbon and calcium carbonate to the seafloor. And this is the primary carbon rich ingredient that over time is cooked into oil and gas. The Niobrara is layered chalks and marls and shales representing periods of very active carbonate deposition intermingled with less productive carbonate de deposition where more shale was deposited. The carbonate rich chalks are the primary unconventional reservoir units and these are our primary development targets uh, in the DJ basin along with the Codell sandstone. Now on the strat column you see on the left of all those units uh, that are listed as pay. These are all uh, vertical and directional targets as well. Uh, but currently only the Niobrara and Codell are the only material horizontal drilling targets in the DJ Basin. So now we're going to move, uh, you know, Dave set the stage on this very well, but we're going to move from the basin to the field to the play within the DJ. And the top left uh, map is an outline of the DJ Basin and the Wattenberg field is shown in red. So the Cretaceous formations that we just discussed on the previous slide were all buried and deformed by the uplift of the Rocky Mountains, as shown in the cross section on the bottom left of the slide. Now the Wattenberg field exists because of a geothermal anomaly. And this is the same geothermal anomaly that's responsible for the Colorado min mineral belt in the central mountains. And the same trend extends out into the DJ basin, providing extra heat to the sedimentary units that are deposited there. Now the combination of deep burial and this extra geothermal heat from the bottom cooked the organic carbon deposited in the marine sediments and generated hydrocarbons that charged reservoir rocks that we produce from today. So the thermal maturity is what defines the play in Wattenberg Field. Now the central map on the slide is a map of thermal maturity or the maximum temperature that was reached uh, by the rocks in Niobrara. The red is hotter, obviously, and getting cooler as you go towards the darker greens on the sides in every direction. The temperature contours correlate to the gas oil ratio and to the API gravity or the, the weight or viscosity of that oil. And in the photo below the map, you can see how um, even the color of these oils changes with thermal maturity. 
The temperature in the cooler green contours uh, generate a heavier, darker oil with little gas. And as you move towards the hot center, you get generate lighter, gassier hydrocarbons. So this slide is really designed to show you the evolution of development in the DJ basin over time with a focus on horizontal drilling. So the bar chart at the bottom shows the formation targets and the method of development through time. And all of the bars represent, all of the blue bars represent um, vertical and directional drilling. The dates are pretty generic, but the first horizontal well was drilled in the DJ in 2008. And the focus here is how Oxy's horizontal development within the NIO and CODEL has really changed in the last 10 years due to advances in drilling technology. And that's the story that I'm going to try to tell with the colorful figure in the center of the slide. So just orienting you to that figure, the top line is oil price, West Texas Intermediate through time. The next line is the number of wells Oxy drilled in each year. The third line is the number of um, Oxy operated rigs in the basin shown by quarter in each year. And the bottom line is the average time that it took Oxy to drill a well of any length during that year. Now in 2011, laterals were less than a mile in length on average. They were probably about 4,500 feet. And in 2021, our average laterals were around two miles. Um, uh, Commissioner Hackett, uh, you know, addressing your question of average lateral length, um, most of our wells now are about two miles. We have drilled some upwards of three um, in very uh, certain specific situations. Now, Rigs and well counts track pretty well with oil price up until about 2014. And there's a steady progress in uh, reducing the time it took to drill these horizontal wells through this time. So these years, we were really growing our development and our rig count increased. Uh, rig count increases were directly leading to well count growing at the same time. Now in late 2014, oil price crashed and in response, you'll see rigs drop off dramatically in 2015. Well counts dropped off too, but not as dramatically as compared to the rig count going forward. We also notice a big reduction in drilling cycle time in 2015 as well. But going forward, cycle time continued to go down and rig counts stayed low and well counts with respect to the number of rigs actually stayed pretty high. So keep in mind our average lateral length during this time is also increasing from one mile, one mile to two mile and our lateral step outs were also increasing it during this time. So the take home message from this figure and what this data really shows is that in 2014 and 2015, kind of where that uh, little barbell is connecting 2014 and 2015, uh, changes in our drilling technology and in the design of our wells allowed us to drill longer wells faster with fewer rigs. And where this becomes material is the photo in the top right, which is um, a photo from the DJ Basin in the 2012 timeframe with five rigs lined up along a county road in Weld County. Um, with our current practices, we could replace all five of those rigs with one rig and drill all those wells from one location. So these improvements mean we're using fewer surface locations and um, leveraging longer wells. And once we're on the location, we're there for a much shorter time. So we've discussed the three types of drilling uh, in the DJ, vertical, directional, and horizontal. And this is just a quick look at uh, very schematically of what those look like. What's not different about these three types of drilling is how wells are cased and cemented to isolate groundwater from hydrocarbon bearing formations. We'll, uh, in the DJ, we'll drill a surface hole uh, to a depth of about 1,800 feet, and then we'll insert a steel pipe into that hole and cement that pipe into the hole, directly to the formation. Uh, we'll then continue to drill out the bottom of that hole and drill the remainder of our well, um, insert a steel casing into that hole, and cement that pipe all the way back up into surface casing. So regardless of the well type that is used, uh, groundwater is protected in the same way, and the casing and cement are tested regularly throughout the life of the well. So this slide goes into the, the rule change and a little bit of the aquifer units in the DJ. The aquifer units in the DJ basin are quite shallow compared to oil and gas reservoirs. The deepest units of the Fox Hills 
which is the deepest aquifer unit, are less than 1,000 feet deep. And what I want to highlight here is the difference between the new rules, which were put into, into effect in November of last year, and the previous rule. And the biggest change is that the, the old rule states that a forma states a formation. So it says 50 feet below the Fox Hills transition zone uh, with regard to protection of surface casing depth. And the new rule specifically says we must protect, must isolate groundwater regardless of formation. So based, this is all based on water quality, regardless of the formation. And then it specifies a top and base of the deepest formation that we must document during the permitting process. So that's the primary difference is that saying we must isolate groundwater removes the obligation of protecting specifically with regards to a formation. Now, I do wanna clarify that Oxy's well and casing design both before and after the rule changes results in full isolation of groundwater from hydrocarbon bearing units. And there's minor differences in well design and the documentation, documentation required during the permitting process. But the intention of this rule is that groundwater is protected regardless of formation. So this slide just shows some of the names and the logos of the various organizations that had input and voice into this rulemaking. And I show this just to highlight that this rule is not made in a vacuum and it should lend some confidence that groundwater in the DJ Basin is and will remain a focus for everybody involved. So now I'm gonna jump into a little bit more of horizontal drilling and geosteering and try to give you an idea of how we drill the wells in the DJ Basin and um, how do we do that and why? And one of the most frequent questions that I get about horizontal drilling is how do they do that? And this is one of those things that in theory is very simple and in practice is, is difficult and I think is pretty cool. Um, so when we're drilling down to our target formations, we rotate the whole pipe and we can drill very fast in a straight line and we call this rotating. That's the figure in the sort of top right of the slide. And when it's time to turn the well horizontal, we drill with a method called sliding. And at the very bottom of the, of the drill pipe, the bottom hole assembly is the bit. And just behind the bit, there's a motor that has a bend in it. And that bend is exaggerated for the purpose of illustration, but it does the job. Um, when we pump mud through that motor, the bit spins without the entire pipe having to spin and the hole drills in the direction of the bend. So we put a kink in the hole and then you rotate ahead and then you slide again and put another kink in the hole. And you do this over and over again until you reach 90 degrees. And you drill ahead in the lateral or the horizontal part of the well, adding directional slides to adjust the well to stay in the geology that you wanna be in. Now the drillers can't do this alone. Uh, the geologists are the eyes of this operation. Geologists are communicating with the drillers on the rig uh, where in the rock to drill to maximize contact with the reservoir. And that's what horizontal drilling is all about. So a lot of planning goes into drilling horizontal wells and that's what kind of makes it possible. The wells, um, in wells with a vertical depth of about 7,300 feet, which is a, around our you know, 7,000 to 7,300 feet is our typical NIO to CODEL landing depth. We typically land these wells with an accuracy of about 15 feet from our plan. To do this, we integrate seismic data and well data and map geologic formations. We identify and map faults that may pose geologic hazards to the well. And we work really closely with our drilling team to communicate what we think is going to happen before we drill the well. And the accuracy of our interpretation results in fewer unplanned changes. And this allows us to be more efficient in our drilling and our cycle times, allows us to drill better wells and stick to our spacings, and uh, also makes for less work on the rig, which they appreciate. So now this, this slide is really sort of operations geology and how a plan comes together, going from the planning phase to actually operating a horizontal well. On the left side, there's a map of the top of the CODEL made from seismic. And on the bottom left is a seismic cross section along the lateral well path, which is shown on the map with the yellow line. The star represents the surface location um, 
of the drill path. So the geologist will use the seismic data to interpret what we think is going to happen and communicate it so that there's fewer surprises. Then as the well is drilled, we interpret data real time from that's collected just behind the bit to understand how we're doing with respect to our original plan. Now the amazing part of this is that the yellow unit that we've landed this well in is a Codell well. As the Codell uh, formation here is about 20 feet thick. We crossed a hundred foot fault in this lateral and we were able to predict what we'd see before we crossed the fault, uh, approximate where we'd cross the fault, and then drill directly back into the Codell formation on the other side of the fault. So to put this in a, some sort of real terms uh, with some landmarks you might be able to appreciate, um, on the top left is Mile High Stadium. And this is a view from Google Earth of Mile High Stadium from about 7,200 feet above the ground. And we're gonna land an eight and three quarter inch drill bit between the 40 yard lines. From there, we're gonna drill a straight line. And it just so happens that the length of the well at the bottom of the slide is about the same distance as from the center of Mile High Stadium to the front door of the state capitol. And when we get to the state capitol, the height of that entryway is about the same thickness of the Codell, it looks to be about 20 feet tall. So we'll land at center field of uh, Mile High Stadium, try not to damage the turf, and then drill two miles directly to the state capitol and we'll, we'll use the front door. All of this we'll be able to do in about five days. So now I just want to take a look at what some of this looks like on the surface and what's changed through the years. Um, the rigs in the DJ Basin are uh, customized to have some of the most state-of-the-art technology that helps us make our operations safer and cleaner and quieter than ever before. There's some of the most technologically advanced rigs in the U.S. onshore rig fleet. And we're constantly trying to improve what we do and how we do it being very conscious of the communities in which we operate. So the pictures at the top are, are just some of the modifications that we've added to our rigs to control noise. And with that, I just wanna say thank you to the numerous colleagues uh, whose work I'm representing here today. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to take them now. Thank you for that presentation, uh, Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Duncan, for the presentation, it was really good. I'm wondering if you can go back to the slide, and I think you were showing formations, and um, on one of them you had the word pay. Yeah. So does that, where you have little asterisks, is that, are those all the formations that potentially have oil or gas? Yes, those are, and, all, those are all identified uh, as potential targets um, within the DJ Basin for oil and gas. And it, it seems like, um, based on your discussion, that the CODEL has already, uh, that drilling has already happened in the CODEL and the Niobrara, mm -hmm. but you didn't talk about the Shannon or the Sussex. So does that mean someday in the future that those might be other formations that might get drilled? So the Shannon, uh, the Shannon is not uh, very well developed over our DJ acreage. The Sussex is. Uh, there okay. are, uh, conven it's more of a conventional sandstone play and it's been predominantly developed um, early with, um, with vertical and directional wells. So we, we did go through a period of trialing horizontal development within the Sussex and didn't find it to be material. Thank you. And so, sorry, another question. Yep. So it, it looks like over time, there's been a lot of development in this field. I'm trying to use the right words here. <laughs> um, and I, I know, um, I think I understand that you don't really want to be drilling in the same spaces because you might affect pressure. You might be um, taking minerals from somebody else. All sorts of things come into play here. So if you, if there's already a horizontal, sorry, if there's already a conventional well where you're going to be drilling horizontally, do you plug those first before you start drilling horizontally? Yes. Um, 
essentially what we do, um, there, are two, there are two options. If the vertical well either doesn't belong to us or um, still has potential future value, then we can do something called a safety prep, which is essentially going in and uh, placing temporary plugs in the well and making sure the wellbore has the integrity to um, withstand any, any potential frack hits. Um, most of the wells that we own, um, that especially the ones that are older, the remaining value is not high enough to justify that work. And so what we'll do is go in and, and plug and abandon that well um, or any of the wells within a, a certain safety buffer around uh, horizontal operations. Other questions from commissioners? Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Duncan. Nice to see a former colleague again. Um, I wanted to uh, clarify something that uh, Commissioner McGowan asked and uh, about specifically kind of the, the, the pay zones and the productive formations in the, in the strat column um, that, that's shown here on the left-hand side. And, and what you mentioned was that the Sussex is not, um, for Oxy, a horizontal uh, target or, or a horizontal, um, uh, I guess it doesn't work with the horizontal wells is what I'm getting at um, in layman's terms. And, uh, but, but you didn't mention anything about the historic production that has occurred in the Sussex, uh, I don't think. So could you talk a little bit about um, the development that has occurred in the Sussex or is currently um, occurring in the Sussex, the Shannon, and, and perhaps maybe give us a little bit of history on when and why each of these formations was developed in the DJ? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. Um, definitely there's been a lot of historic production in the Sussex and from the J-Sand. Um, over, over the course of the DJ Basin development, um, a lot of wells were drilled to the Sussex and then they were deepened. Um, so they would then recognize that there were deep, deeper targets, drill them down to the J-Sand and then perf the J-Sand and then they would actually move up hole and perf the Codel later and commingle that production and then perf the Niobrara later. Um, and then as shown on uh, the slide with the timelines, uh, they would do refracts and trifracts of many of these vertical wells uh, to continue to stimulate the production. So um, the Sussex has been a very productive interval within the DJ Basin over the years. Um, I, I can't speak to volumes off the top of my head, that'd be a bad idea. Um, I would butcher the numbers. Um, however, it's, it has been, you can see going back to the 1970s, a, a, a highly productive interval. Uh, there are other operators who are continuing to put wells into the Sussex. I believe they're mostly verticals and directionals. Um, I'm not, if there are operators drilling horizontals, I'm, I'm unaware of them. That's very helpful. I appreciate that, Mr. Duncan. And yeah, what I was getting at is just that historically, you know, we've seen lots of development in Colorado, in the Dakota sand, in the J sand, in the vertical well specifically, in the vertical world specifically, um, the Codel, the Nio, and the Sussex. So um, very helpful. Um, there's also been, you know, it's not it's not mentioned as a as as a pay zone, um, but the Greenhorn has seen some development and exploration in Colorado as well. Yes, and that's another formation that uh, we appraised. Uh, a handful of years ago and, and found it not to be competitive at the time. Thank you. Other questions from commissioners? Commissioner Najapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Duncan, for the, the information. Um, a lot of um, great information, and I'm a very visual person, so I appreciate all the diagrams as well. Um, I was uh, you you showed about um you know once you start drilling horizontally you're you're also trying to kind of follow along the formation as it you know might sort of um you know with the geology of the area might sort of undulate um but you also kind of showed this example um about uh, when you're talking about geosteering yeah this, this is the slide that's right thank you um and and avoiding geologic ha hazards and, and going across this fault line area. Um, I wondered if you could kind of go a little bit further in depth about um, how you make those determinations and also what, if any, um, challenges you've encountered 
in crossing that type of an, an area where there's a fault zone or um, and, and yeah. what you do when and if um, uh, seismic activity occurs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I could talk about this all day. Uh, I will try not to do that. <laughs> um, uh, so first of all, uh, yes, the addressing the geohazards and, and the faults uh, that you see, I have geohazard written up there in red, right above, above that red formation. Um, that's the basal unit of the Pierre Shale, which we call the Sharon Springs. And the reason that that's a geohazard is because it is a um, reactive shale, which means it swells in contact with water. And it's also been known to be very unstable when it's cut at an angle above about 50 or 60 degrees. So when we drill our, our curve and our landing through this part of the well, we try to cut it um, as close to vertical as we can, or you know, certainly less than about 50 degrees. Um, and then um, we don't see any issues with it. In wells in the past where we have, you know, if we were trying to target this green layer and we cut this red unit right here, we've done that in the past and where we have, we've seen the hole begin to begin to collapse, which can uh, essentially stick the well bore, uh, stick the BHA in the hole. Um, that's bad. It takes time and energy and money and um, it's not an outcome that anybody wants to deal with. We end up having to sidetrack the well. Um, and so our primary responsibility as geologists is to do our best job to, to make sure that we don't, we don't cut that unit if we can. Um, so in a situation like this, this is a big fault. Even for Wattenberg standards, 100 foot is, is not something we cross every day. Um, but we cut faults in every well bore. Um, it's a highly faulted field and there's a lot of structure and we cut faults all the time. So part of what, what we do on the planning side is do our best guess to estimate how large we think that fault is going to be, where it's going to come in and how we can adjust our plan to make sure that we, we drill as close to plan as possible. And this is actually probably a better representation of how we, how we typically try to uh, target intervals where we know there's going to be a big fault. If we try to chase the codel down and follow that formation down, then once we cross that fault, we're going to be way far away and have a long struggle to get back to our producing formation. So rather than do that, when we can uh, predict the interpretive fault, we just plan for it and try to target where we think it's going to come in on the other side. And that's really what this is this is showing is how we use the real-time data to take our expectation of what we think is gonna happen and make sure that that's actually becoming true. Um, your other question related to seismicity, um, these, are not, uh, these are not tectonic faults. So these aren't faults that are related to, um, to plate movement or anything like that. These are not faults that are uh, reactivated by, um, by frac pressure. Uh, and especially not drilling. Um, what we do see from time to time is we'll cross a fault and maybe there'll be some gas trapped within that fault plane and you'll see an influx of gas into the well bore that then drilling will circulate out um, and that's why our locations have flares. Uh, those flares are to safely manage the gas, remove the gas from the mud, separate it and burn it in a place away from people that is, uh, that is safe. Thank you. I appreciate those explanations and, and especially the, that last part about the um, the differences in these types of faults that um, is definitely um, something I wasn't uh, as clear on. Um, but when you were talking about that sort of upper layer in your diagram here being the geohazard mm -hmm. um, and and some of the issues that have occurred, I think you, you mentioned the term sidetracking. Does that mean that you sort of then direct the drill bit off to the side and to go around and, but what, what is happening? Is this all still subsurface or what is happening at the surface when something like that happens? Um, well, there's a lot of phone calls are being made. Uh, <laughs> that's the first thing. Um, yes, when we're sidetracking at the surface, you wouldn't necessarily know uh, what's going on. I mean, uh, 
Um, there might be fewer pieces of pipe going in the hole, but other than that, um, not a lot different happening. Uh, there's two different ways to sidetrack uh, that we typically rely on. The first is if we're in the lateral and we can do an open hole sidetrack. Um, if there's some sort of a bend or a kink in the well, um, we'll use that location and go into the hole with a more aggressive bit and motor and try to just drill off in a different direction from that point in the well bore. And then the rest of the well bore will be left abandoned um, and eventually collapse on itself. Um, the other way to do it is if uh, we had um, some sort of an issue in the curve or the landing, we could go in and pump cement and abandon the original, uh, the original hole with cement and then use that cement plug as a, a surface to, to kick off and drill away in another direction again. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And then the last question that I had, um, actually just learned this the other day, and, and but I think it would be useful for others listening. Um, how big are we talking about with the hole that's in the ground? You know, what is the diameter of the drill bit? And, you know, the so when you're talking about something collapsing on itself, how much distance are we talking about? Yeah, I mean, we're talking about, you know, something like a big cereal bowl or a small mixing bowl. I mean, it's an eight and three quarter inch drill bit. Um, not a big hole. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that was that was actually very surprising to me to learn. I just sort of imagine this like massive, you know, thing like uh, what was that movie um, Armageddon or whatever, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, so I, I sort of imagine this this huge thing. And so then to think about it going in into these layers and then coming out and the, the space that I imagined was left. Yeah. Um, it is, you know, now I'm learning is very, is very different. It's, it's a smaller space that's um, being disturbed overall. Um, so uh, I appreciate just learning all of this information um, and, and just better understanding it. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Other questions for Mr. Duncan? I'm not seeing any further questions, Mr. Duncan. Could you make sure that you get your, if you don't mind, get your slideshow to us so that we can have that available for future review? Yes, absolutely. Thanks Great. a lot for the time. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks for your time and for being part of this uh, informative panel. Uh, I believe now we're going to Michael Leibovitz um, with Keras. Is that right, Commissioner McGowan? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see you. Okay, uh, my name is Mike Leibowitz. I am the lead geologist at Kara Soil and Gas. Um, I'm going to give you a presentation today on the uh, geology of the Piance Basin uh, and come some of the distinctive uh, attributes of that. Okay, uh, sometimes there's a little bit of lag time between uh, when I change slides and when it shows up. So I'm going to tell everyone what I'm looking at and I'd appreciate if I get a little feedback and if you're seeing the same thing. Um, so can everyone see the slide that says uh, Kara's Piance position? No, we're seeing a slide that is um, actually us all frozen. Oh, drat. Um, I think you need to share a different screen. Yeah, let me uh, I'll share. Can you see the slide deck? No, um, we're, we're seeing kind of a frozen screenshot. I think the slide deck's behind. Yeah. Um, in the interest of saving people some time, I know I uh, sent this to a member of the staff. Is it possible anyone there could share it or? Uh, uh, hearings manager Larson or hearings manager Amaro. Any love for us here? Mr. Chair, yeah, yes, Mr. Chair, I will go ahead for him. 
and it'll be just one second. Okay, Mr. Leibowitz, I think we're gonna have Ms. Amaro share, and then you can just tell her to advance the screen when you're ready for the next slide. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that very much. Give us just a second to Can you see his um, slideshow, Mr. Chair? No. Not yet? Okay, can you just... Not yet. There you go. Okay, you're in okay. screen presentation. Uh, Mr. Great. Leibowitz, we see Keras operating uh, with the rig and Piance development. So I think you're good to go. Thank you. Uh, if we can advance to the next slide. Uh, so my, again, my name is Mike Leibowitz. I work for Keras Oil and Gas. Uh, we operate in Colorado uh, exclusively in the Piance Basin today. Um, the Piance Basin, as I think was alluded to earlier, is located here in the northwest corner of the state. Uh, you can see the location map in the upper right. Um, the left side of the screen is a uh, structure map on the base of the Mesa Verde group. Um, that's kind of the base of our reservoir group. And so this shows the general shape of the uh, structure of the basin. And so you can see it's highly asymmetric this deeply dipping eastern flank, and then this very gently dipping eastern monocline that extends all the way out, just about to Grand Junction. Um, pretty much everything kind of in the green uh, to red in this map is uh, gas saturated. Um, and so this is part of one of these continuous gas uh, accumulations that uh, Dave Andrews referred to earlier. Um, so Keras operates roughly 4,300 wells in the basin at this time. Uh, we have one rig actively drilling right now. Um, and our production stream is 94% methane, and the other 6% is uh, a trace amount of oil and then natural gas liquids that are associated with that methane stream and get knocked out uh, later in the production cycle. Um, again, this cross section in the lower right here just shows that symmetry of the basin. Uh, and you can see uh, the eastern edge of the basin is defined by the hogback monocline, which kind of wraps around from uh, Meeker all the way down to um, Glenwood Springs. Um, we go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so this is a strat chart of uh, the rocks present within the Piance Basin on the right, and then a map showing some of the structural features on the left. Um, so briefly, most of the formations present in the Piance are genetically related. That means they were deposited at the same time as part of the same depositional continuum as the rocks you have on the front range. Um, so especially uh, this section in the Cretaceous here, uh, most of these rocks have equivalent, or in some cases, just the same identical unit, more or less, here in the Piance versus the Front Range. Um, if you just advance this, uh, hit forward real quick, I think a blue arrow will show up. Maybe not. Oh. You go. I think we went backwards. Yeah. Um, in any case, so the rock uh, names and a lot of the thicknesses in the Cretaceous section there and the upper Jurassic are almost identical. Um, and what's different about the Piance is we have this big, thick Paleozoic section that's not present um, in the, the DJ base in the front range. And additionally, we have a thick tertiary or Cenozoic section on top that's not really present in the DJ. So um, we have about 10,000 feet of these Cretaceous rocks present. It's a little thicker, but similar to what's present in the DJ. Um, however, we have an additional six to 8,000 feet of these Cenozoic rocks on top of that 
that are really not present in the DJ. Um, in addition to that, you can see we have a bunch of source rocks distributed throughout this stack. And the source rocks are shown um, as these black S's throughout the section. So one difference is we have this uh, Paleozoic source rock down in the lower Permian, upper Mississippian. Um, and that was exploited back in the 1930s, essentially with the discovery of Rangeley Field. Um, and then we have a series of source rocks located throughout the upper Cretaceous section there. And those again are largely equivalent to what you have in the DJ basin. Um, what's again, very different is we have uh, several of these source rocks distributed throughout the tertiary section as well, including the Green River oil shale, very thick, uh, highly uh, concentration of organic carbon source rock that uh, exists at or near the surface throughout much of the basin. Um, if you're all wondering, and I don't want to steal from anyone's uh, future presentation here, but most of these source rocks and these reservoir rocks we're going to talk about today are in the upper Cretaceous. Um, it turns out we can go almost anywhere in the world, and if we have a thick marine upper Cretaceous section, there's like an 80 or 90 percent chance we're going to have some source rocks present there. Um, so just kind of a, a helpful hint when we're looking at all these. That's a common theme throughout the world in the upper Cretaceous. If we go to the next slide. Okay, so um, up to now I've kind of described uh, what's similar to the DJ. What's very different is the thickness and the geometry of our reservoir. So we primarily uh, developed the Williams Fork Reservoir in the Piance Basin. This is part of the Upper Mesa Verde group. Um, that formation is characterized primarily by these discontinuous sandstone bodies. Um, they were deposited in a very different environment of deposition than say like the Niobrara on the front range. So these have a much more finite lateral length, uh, but the section is pretty thick. It's 3,500, almost 4,000 feet thick in certain parts of the basin. So our strategy to develop that part of the reservoir has been to drill vertically through it and uh, complete a number of these sandstones within the section. And then we, uh, to add more to that, we typically will pick a central location in like a one square section and we'll drill about as many uh, wells from that central location as is physically possible, uh, both to alleviate our uh, environmental impact in the area and also just to centralize our uh, facilities. Um, so that leads to some engineering challenges. Um, so you've heard up to now about these two mile and in some cases three mile laterals. Because we have to penetrate the reservoir vertically um, and because of the, some of the mechanical constraints on how we drill these wells, we can't reach two miles from our locations. We can reach about 3000 feet from our central location. And that's kind of our lateral limit of how far laterally we can develop from our central location. So that's just one of the things that makes us a little different. Um, Again, very different reservoir. Um, we don't use any propent in our fracks. Uh, so we do hydrofract this reservoir just like they do in the DJ. However, uh, in the DJ where there would be a pretty healthy amount of propent or sand in that hydrofract mix, uh, we uh, hydrofract exclusively with uh, formation water really. Um, so at this point in time, we are 95% recycled fluid in all of our completions activities. Um, we add a minor amount of chemical as a friction reducer uh, and sometimes some clay inhibition if we have to do a freshwater draw. But beyond that, we're really just pump, we're really just recycling our produced water in this operation. Um, I think that's it for this slide. If you can go to the next slide. Okay. And then finally, another uh, thing that makes Piance really different. Uh, we have quite a bit of surface topography throughout the basin. So from the Colorado River Valley to the top of the Rowan Plateau is easily 3,000 feet from place to place. Um, and we produce from the same reservoir. So when we drill down in the valley, we can use essentially conventional drilling practices. Um, and we'll drill with, we, prefer, we refer to it in pounds per gallon. So a 12.8 pound per gallon mud might be employed uh, to drill a valley location. Um, that's not nothing particularly onerous or spectacular about that. 
when we go up on top of the mesa, we have to drill the same formation, it has the same pressure, um, and that can result in having to use uh, mud as 6.4 pounds per gallon. So that's significantly lighter than uh, water, or less dense, pardon me, than water. And so the way we achieve that is we utilize air and the drill string. Um, and then sometimes we employ another mechanical trick where we'll actually put what we call a parasite string alongside the surface casing. And we'll actually pump air down that to further assist uh, circulation throughout the wellbore. So these are just some of the different challenges we deal with in the Piance Basin. Uh, that concludes all of my slides and uh, be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, do we have questions? I, just quickly, um, parasite sting, string, sting, that's not a term that I'm familiar with. Could you explain that to us a little bit? Sure. So um, when we drill up on a, in a high elevation location, uh, we will drill our surface casing hole down to uh, somewhere between 2,500 and 3,500 feet. Um, and then as we're running the surface casing, at the very bottom of the casing, we run a little side entry port shoe. It, it's basically a piece of casing with a hole in the side of it. And then we'll weld this pipe into that hole. And we actually weld a little one inch diameter pipe all up along the side of the surface casing as we're running the surface casing. So it, it look, doesn't look that different than it is in that little schematic right in front of you there. And that assists with the air injection or what's the purpose behind that? That's exactly right. Yeah, we uh, inject air right down to that point at a uh, surface casing and that helps to unload our well bore and alleviate some of the back pressure in the well. Thank you. Other questions from commissioners? Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Liebitz, for your presentation. Um, because of the because of the um, topography of the area and its unevenness, are you all able to pipe your product, or does it require more um, trucks to take, for example, or tanks? So depending on the location, we may truck uh, product. Um, that's somewhat of a byproduct of when the area was developed. So the, re the only reason I'm saying that is because where we're currently drilling right now, um, everything is piped. We uh, flow the entire flow stream back to from like, say, a 30 well pad back to a central uh, processing facility where all the fluids are separated. And there's essentially no um, product trucking going on at all to any of our present drilling locations. There are other locations where we may not have that option, but where we're developing right now, yeah, everything is uh, somewhat truckless. Thank you. And um, are you are you all in a similar situation to the DJ where there's there there may be existing older infrastructure that you're addressing as you're doing newer types of drilling or not so much? Uh, can you clarify? Um, so I think the DJ Basin to me seems very busy with wells that have existed for quite some time and then newer wells and different types of drilling, horizontal drilling, new technology. Um, and I'm wondering if the Piance Basin has similar issues where you have existing, drill, existing wells and infrastructure that you have to address or go around or deal with as you're putting in new wells? So where we're drilling today, the short answer is no. Um, they've been drilling in the Piance Basin since, uh, I think, you know, Mr. Andrews' slide showed as early as 1890, that White River Dome uh, well is, is in our area. Um, but really serious development started in the 30s. Um, and so there is some of that, but where we're presently active, uh, no, that, that's not really a concern. Other questions from commissioners? Okay, I'm not seeing further 
questions. Um, uh, I note your slides, uh, hopefully we can get your slides as well so that we can have a pack from these presentations today. And with that, um, it is 11 a.m. Um, we don't have a break schedule, but I could do a 10 minute break. So why don't we do 10 minutes? We've got three more operators to present before we move into executive session. That'll probably get us to about the noon slice, even if we take 10 minutes. So why don't we return at 11.10 and we will then hear from Michael Hannigan and then Mackenzie Smith and then Christy Zeller. Hello folks, uh, it's 1110, we'll get started again. Thank you for the indulgence. Uh, my coffee is now refreshed and I'm ready to roll. Um, I believe we've got uh, Mr. Hannigan, uh, EHS supervisor for Kinder Morgan that will be up next to provide us with perspective on geology in Southwest Colorado. Okay, so um, should I share my screen or will you be pushing the slides? Uh, your screen is, someone's screen is shared. I think that is uh, okay. our hearings manager. And so if you just wanna tell us when you wanna move to the next slide, we can do that. Yes. Got it. Okay, thank you. My name is Mike Hannigan. I am uh, with the EHS and regulatory group of Kinder Morgan CO2 Company LLC in Cortez, Colorado. Um, this first photo was taken at night from one of our drilling locations on Canyons of the Ancients National Monument. So let's go to the next slide, please. On the left is an image that you probably recognize from Dave Andrews' presentation showing the oil and gas production basins in Colorado. Um, the Kinder Morgan CO2 production area is outlined by the red rectangle in the southwest corner of the state. And on the right is a zoomed in view of the Kinder Morgan CO2 production area showing the outlines of our two federal production units the Doe Canyon unit and the McElmo Dome unit. Um, our production units are situated on the southeastern edge of the Paradox Basin. So next slide, please. So all of Kinder Morgan's uh, carbon dioxide production is from the Leadville Formation. It consists of uh, Mississippian aged, limestone and dolomite, dolomite that varies from 300 to 400 feet in thickness and occurs at depths between 8,000 and 8,500 feet below ground surface. This is uh, a significantly older rock than most of the production that you've heard about earlier today. Um, the two units have a combined surface area of 256,000 acres. Um, most recent form seven that we submitted reports a total of 85 active production wells in both units, 72 wells in the McElmo Dome unit and 13 in the Doe Canyon unit. Um, approximately 62% of the surface area and 77% of the minerals are under federal ownership. Next slide, please. Um, in this slide, I wanted to provide you with some data regarding our production operations since we are so different than uh, the oil and gas operators that you encounter on the front range. 
our gas composition is relatively pure carbon dioxide uh, with the McElmo Dome unit producing a slightly higher concentration than Doe Canyon. We have uh, an excess of 85 miles of gathering lines between our wells, our 15 cluster facilities, and seven central processing facilities. Our reservoir pressure is used to move all of our gas from the wells to the central facilities. There's no compression required at any of our well locations. The carbon dioxide is compressed at our central facilities and transported by pipeline to the Permian Basin in West Texas and southeastern New Mexico and the Anath Field in southeastern Utah, where it's used in enhanced oil recovery or EOR projects. Kinder Morgan CO2 production was pretty steady at approximately 1.2 billion cubic feet per day until COVID-19 impacted our demand and we've been producing between 700 and 800 million cubic feet per day since April of 2020. Let's, th those, those photos are two of our uh, central production facilities one in the Doe Canyon unit at the bottom and uh, one in the McElmo Dome unit at the top. So next slide, please. So the figure on the left shows the McElmo Dome and Doe Canyon production units relative to several geologic and physiographic features in the Four Corners region. As shown in a previous slide, the McElmo Dome and Doe Canyon units are situated on the southeastern edge of the Paradox Basin. Much younger igneous rocks were intruded into the region, which are indicated by those yellow blobs on the, in the figure on the left, which are the sources of carbon dioxide that we produce. So carbon dioxide is one of the volcanic gases associated with igneous intrusions, um, such as the Sleeping Ute Mountain, the San Juan Mountains in Colorado, and the Abajo and La Salle Mountains in Utah. Carbon dioxide moved into the relatively porous and permeable limestone and dolomite of the Leadville Formation and was trapped there by overlying salts and shales of the Paradox Formation. Uh, that Paradox Formation has a sequence uh, with a thickness of about 2,000 feet. Um, next slide, please. So, as mentioned in a previous slide, uh, the thickness of the Leadville Formation varies between 300 and 400 feet. Figure on the right uh, shows a typical log of the Leadville Formation and calls out the different zones that we refer to here. Um, the 100 level and the base karst the 200 level, the 300 level, and 400 level. Um, the gas cap, or CO2, is typically encountered in the 100 and 200 levels. The 400 level is wet. It's saturated with uh, salt water. And the 300 level may produce gas or water, depending on the location within a unit and uh, proximity to local faults. Um, the figure on the left is a Leadville structural map with the warmer colors being relatively higher than the cooler colors. So that map shows that the Dokan and, and McElmo Dome units are structural high points within the Paradox Basin. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the depths of the various geologic formations that we drill through on our way to potential targets in the Leadville. Since published geologic literature indicates that fresh water is found in rock units all the way down to the Chinle Formation, we set our surface casing approximately 150 feet into the Cutler Formation, approximately 2,500 feet below ground surface, plus or minus and then cement it to surface. This is how we prevent any interaction between any underground sources of drinking water. 
which is defined in the Safe Drinking Water Act as uh, any water that contains less than 10,000 milligrams per liter TDS. Um, that's how we prevent uh, any interaction between uh, what is produced in the well bore and any potential underground sources of drinking water. We typically drill any S-curve wells uh, between the surface casing chew and the top of the paradox formation, um, primarily due to the difficult drilling conditions encountered in the salts and shales above the Leadville. Uh, we prefer drilling a vertical hole through the paradox because the plasticity of those salts and shales, which creates an effective seal over the reservoir, also presents uh, significant challenges to successful drilling. The intermediate or production casing string is set at the top of the reservoir, approximately 50 feet into the Leadville formation. And we currently cement a four and a half inch liner over the producing interval of the reservoir. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just wanted to show you some photographs of our well locations during drilling and production activities. Um, one of the questions from commissioners involved, uh, you know, changes in drilling uh, operations for say um, conventional versus unconventional wells. We drill vertical wells, we drill directional wells, um, we have tried horizontal, they don't seem to work well in the Leadville formation, um, but regardless, uh, drilling operations are pretty much the same whether we're doing a vertical or a directional hole. Uh, the photo on the top left is uh, precision super single drilling rig on one of our more recent wells. And the photo on the top right is a typical workover rig that we use for well completions. Uh, after we move the, uh, the precision rig off the location. Um, we have used closed loop uh, systems on all of our new drills since 2014. Um, after drilling and completion, our production well locations have uh, very little in the way of equipment, no tank batteries, separators or compressors. Um, photo on the lower left is a typical wellhead and uh, above ground spool piece um, going to a buried flow line. And the photo on the lower right is a well equipped with a diethylene glycol skid, which uh, utilizes a metering pump to inject diethylene glycol into the produced gas in order to prevent the formation of hydrates during the colder months of the year. And uh, diethylene glycol is like a, an antifreeze. It's a, a glycol inhibitor or a hydrate inhibitor, I should say. Uh, next slide, please. That's uh, sunset on the Cow Canyon Central Processing Facility in the McElmo Dome with the Abajo and LaSalle Mountains on the horizon. And that's all I have for you as far as presentation. Be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Hannigan, for your presentation. Um, just some, just some generic questions for me because I'm not as familiar with this production activity. But um, you know, just throwing out a couple of different thoughts. But you know, how much CO2 is produced? Um, what's the percentage of the production there versus kind of other areas in the U.S.? Where, 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 where does it go? How does it leave? Um, where, where are you in the life of the play of this? just kind of follow up just general questions about this sort of unique um, activity that's occurring in Southwest Colorado. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a very unique activity. Um, Shell Western exploration and production uh, started this development in the mid eighties. Uh, Kinder Morgan purchased it in 2000 and has been uh, the, 
the operator since that time. Um, we compress the gas that we produce, uh, put most of it in the Cortez pipeline and uh, transport it to via pipeline to uh, the Permian Basin in West Texas. And uh, from there it gets distributed to southeastern New Mexico and also uh, so we, we have partners that we work with, uh, I believe Oxy, Chevron, ExxonMobil are all partners. Uh, everybody shares in the uh, gas that we produce. They re-inject it into, um, a lot of times they are former uh, oil production reservoirs that have kind of played out. So when I say enhanced oil recovery or EOR, that is a relatively um, uh, important component of production down in the Permian Basin. So the CO2 is re-injected. They flood that formation and strip all the uh, remaining oil from the pore spaces. And uh, the production is uh, surprisingly good. And, um, and that's due to the miscibility of the oil in the CO2. For some reason, you know, you've probably heard of saltwater floods. Uh, that's like secondary recovery. Um, water and oil don't mix very well, but uh, for some reason, CO2 and oil um, are quite miscible and it proves to be a very successful um, recovery method. And I'm sorry, was there, there was another component to your question. Just like, where is, you know, where okay. are you in terms of the life of the play of this um, mineral asset? Okay, so, so we have, in the early days, uh, production was uh, several hundred million uh, standard cubic feet per day. Um, I think our, our record production day was 1.4 billion cubic feet. Um, we've been operating for 34, 35 years. And at this time, uh, we are looking at continued production for at least another 20 years, maybe more. Um, I think I think with uh, the options of booster compression, we may be able to extend the life of the field as long as there is demand for CO2 uh, from these EOR projects. Um, one other um, somewhat technical question. How do you address the or handle hydrogen sulfide? I think that's a component that you have to deal with, right? That's true. And so hydrogen sulfide is encountered primarily when we're drilling through uh, units in the Paradox Formation. So, you know, we're on the edge of the Paradox Basin. Um, a lot of the hydrocarbon plays are maybe more toward the center of the basin. Uh, we're down here kind of on the edge, but occasionally we will encounter some hydrocarbon bearing formations as we go through the paradox shales. And those, we're very careful uh, drilling through those. And if we do encounter hydrogen sulfide gas, that's usually where it occurs. We've analyzed our gas. Um, Typically, our, uh, our H2S concentrations in the gas stream are less than one part per million, um, significantly less than one part per million in McElmo Dome, and a little higher in Doe Canyon.
Mr. Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Hannigan, for the presentation. Um, what one question that I had was: um, what, are, are you dealing with any produced water in this uh, in these operations? And if so, how is that addressed? Yes, we produce. Um, we produce salt water and we have uh, three active saltwater disposal wells. Um, you know, when you produce, uh, you know, 1.2 billion cubic feet of gas a day, um, you're, you're bound to produce uh, some component of water um, and we actually produce oil as well. So uh, the oil is usually separated from the water that we produce. And that is, uh, it's a relatively uh, small volume, three to 400 barrels a month um, on the oil side. On the water side, um, it varies depending on production between, you know, three to uh, 10,000 barrels per day. And we have a produced water transfer system throughout the McElmo Dome field, and then uh, three disposal wells. Uh, one is currently permitted with uh, COGCC. Two are still class one wells permitted by EPA. And we've had all three of these since uh, the mid 80s. And we're currently um, trying to transfer the permit for one of our disposal wells from UIC class one administered by EPA to uh, UIC class two administered by COGCC. Okay, thank you for that. And as far as the separation goes and being able to separate the oil, the water, the CO2, and at one point you had indicated that there's not any separation equipment on these pads. Is that, is that then just getting piped to a centralized uh, facility that does this separation? Right, so we, we have central processing facilities that involve separation and compression. Okay. And then in, in some of our fields within McElmo Dome and at Doe Canyon, we also have what we call cluster facilities, which have uh, separators where we knock out the uh, the first water that's that's easy to remove, and then we pump that water to uh, in Doe Canyon. We pump it to the plant. We truck it from the plant to one of our disposal wells in McElmo Dome, and at our fields down in McElmo Dome, where we've got uh, six central processing facilities with compression and. Uh, separation, we also have maybe 15 or 14 what we call cluster facilities where we do initial separation before that gas uh, makes its way over to the central facility. So we, and then we either pump or we use, uh, we use pressure in the system, uh, reservoir pressure uh, that we're able to utilize to move that water to our disposal wells. Okay. And is there, you know, any processes that Kinder Morgan utilizes for the reuse and recycling of water, or is there any uh, piping to other operators for reuse uh, or recycling of water, or is it just going, uh, is it just being disposed of in the uh, underground disposal wells? Yeah, it's, it, we don't we don't take any fluid from uh, any other operators. Our wells are specifically for our use, and uh, the total dissolved solids content is pretty high to the point where I mean it's it's fifteen to twenty five thousand milligrams per liter TDS. So I mean, in order to make that usable, it would it would uh, not be cost effective. So we 
basically send it back down. Uh, most of it goes in back into the Leadville formation uh, into areas that don't impact our gas production. Okay. And my last question is, is just out of curiosity. My understanding is that that area also has um, wells specific for helium. And how does helium play into the CO2 and these different geologic formations over there? Yeah, I forgot to mention that. Um, our Doe Canyon plant, our Doe Canyon unit, uh, has relatively high helium concentrations. And we're talking about, um, you know, I, I think it's in the neighborhood of maybe one part per million, uh, maybe, maybe approaching two parts per million. Um, and Air Products constructed uh, a plant adjacent to our Doe Canyon Central Processing Facility. And the gas stream that we collect, that we gather, uh, we, we boost the pressure, send it to Air Products, they strip the helium out and send that gas stream back to us. And um, I'm sorry if your next question is, uh, you know, what the helium production is of that plant. I am not familiar with that, but I know it's, it's substantial. Okay. No, thanks for that. I don't have any other questions. From commissioners, Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you, Mr. Hannigan. I, sorry, I, could you, I think I need some clarification after Commissioner Robbins' question about how the CO2 is used, which seems to me that you're selling it to other oil and gas operators to send down an already a, um, a well that's producing but maybe has reduced production and the CO2 is sent down and it and it does what and how did sorry it's not clear to me yeah that's okay uh, and okay and, and just so you understand uh, Kinder Morgan also has uh, EOR assets in the Permian Basin. So Kinder Morgan CO2 company is also uh, an oil producer. Um, we produce anywhere from, you know, 20 to 35,000 barrels per day um, from EOR. So typically on, a, on an older oil field in the Permian, you have a lot of infrastructure that's already in the ground. And they can use existing infrastructure as well as drilling new wells. And they will inject, or what they call flood, that oil bearing formation with CO2. And, and they use a pressure gradient to drive that front of CO2 that's now pushing oil toward production wells. Thank you. And so um, the CO2 is basically just heading right back down into the ground where it started from. Right. And some, and some of it comes back up with the oil, which they capture and recycle so that they don't have to have fresh CO2 every time they want to do a new, uh, you know, develop a new part of that uh, EOR project. But yeah, I mean, to answer your question, everything is sequestered. Mr. Chair, you're on mute. You'd think after like a year and a half of doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, other questions from commissioners? Mr. Chair? Yeah, Commissioner Hackett. And I didn't want to cut off questions if commissioners had other questions, but just wanted to um, note, it's, this is more of a comment, not directly related to 
some of the matter that we discussed today, but it is related to the Doe Creek Canyon um, facility. Just wanted to make sure you are all aware that in 2017, CDPHE's Oil and Gas Health Information and Response Program did conduct an, a community investigation with air quality to um, look at VOC levels and hydrogen sulfide levels at that Doe Canyon facility. The results of that um, report are on the website colorado.gov forward slash OG health. Um, and fortunately at that time, fortunately at that time, the um, results of that community investigation determined that there was a low risk for harmful health effects due to exposures from VOCs and hydrogen sulfides. And it's very important to note that that conclusion there is only you know, related to the time periods that the samples were conducted and the locations that they were conducted and the pollutants that we um, sampled for. So there are some limitations with that, but just wanted to make sure people were aware of that report if you are interested in reading up on that. Thank you, Commissioner Hackett, um, for that. Do you know if there's any, was, was that done as a result of a complaint or was that done as a result of just your investigative team? And do you know if there's any thought about whether there's a need for follow-up? So that one was in response to complaints. Um, typically that program tries to send um, monitoring resources out in response to complaints. At this point, um, I'm not aware of any um, plans in place for a follow-up investigation. And um, if that program has been receiving any ongoing complaints about that facility, um, I haven't heard about that. So um, at this point, I just don't know that we are receiving any complaints from that facility. Um, and there's no concrete plans, at least right now, to send our monitoring resources. We have uh, quite a few facilities to balance, uh, priorities to balance, and where to send those monitoring resources. And I might ask uh, AAG Minor to show up if he's with us. Uh, he may not be, I'm not sure, but he might be able to help us understand what the thresholds that we would look for are um, if we see from him. Um, if not, Mr. Hannigan, did you have any comment on that? Um, the only comment I have is um, I think a lot of the, the complaints that we have are more odor complaints that are related to, you know, uh, I, I mentioned that we have uh, a, a very minor concentration of hydrogen sulfide, but we also have other sulfur compounds uh, as a group that are refer referred to as thiols. Um, in a, in a very, very low concentration, uh, they have a very strong odor. Um, you're familiar with uh, like methyl mercaptan that's put in natural gas as an odorant so that you can detect it when there's a leak. Um, that's, that's a thiol. Another thiol is uh, skunk spray. So not only are they uh, detectable at very low concentrations, they're uh, very unpleasant. And, and we do have several uh, of those sulfur compounds present at very low concentrations in our gas stream at Doe Canyon. So what we've done, um, I think since 2017, we have really uh, improved our vapor recovery systems at the central processing facility and at the uh, cluster we have in Doe Canyon. And we have backups uh, for all the uh, components for when they break down. So um, I think we've done a pretty good job of mitigating that odor complaint. Great, thank you, Mr. Hannigan. Um, Mr. Miner, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I did see you showed up. Did you want to comment here at all? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I can just answer your question, which is that the, the threshold for um, what we would consider to be a, a hydrogen sulfide area in um, Rule 612 is 100 parts per million concentration in the gas stream. I, I think I heard Mr. Hannigan say that um, the concentration they've measured in their gas stream is, is one parts per million. So I think that that higher concentration is more likely what we would see maybe a little further north there in the, the Paradox Basin where Apparently it's higher. And of course, with hydrogen sulfide, we're thinking more about safety, right? Preventing an exposure risk than, than health um, in terms of direct inhalation because of the sort of unique risks posed by that gas. So that's a little separate in you know, our regulatory sphere than maybe that sort of 
health related or odor related um, issues that CDPH was looking into with some of the BOCs would be potentially my guess, but it's good that they were monitoring for that too, because it's of course a really critical safety issue. Excellent. Yeah, and I didn't mean to take us down a rabbit hole. I know we're talking geology 101, but sometimes it's good to get this other stuff out there so that our stakeholders can understand and we can see our questioning. Um, other questions along this line or otherwise for Mr. Hannigan? Great. Seeing none, Mr. Hannigan, thank you very much for presenting to us today. I would note for everyone that's with us today, uh, there's approximately 79 folks that we did put in the chat a direct link to all of the uh, PowerPoints. So you all have access to that um, if you so desire. And with that, we would turn to Mackenzie Smith, uh, Production Engineer for Evergreen Natural Resources. Hi, can you guys hear me? We can hear you, Ms. Smith, Perfect. yes, and we can see you. Hi. Perfect, hello. I recognize some faces on here. Um, I'm going to share my screen, is that all right? Yeah. Okay, um, let's see how I'll do it. All right. Can you guys see screen without slide or without notes? Yep, we see screen without notes. Perfect, wow, that was, Made it through. Winning. <laughs> <laughs> Starting off strong. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you guys um, for having Evergreen here as well as other operators uh, and providing us an opportunity to explain what we do. Um, my name is Mackenzie Smith. I am a petroleum engineer with Evergreen. I've been here for about three, two and a half, three years now. So um, I'm going to basically just be explaining to you all today how um, the Raton Basin differs from other basins in the state. I know that, um, you know, Evergreen has participated in comments and feedback before where we've, um, you know, explained bits and pieces of it, but it's um, having you guys just seen the DJ Basin. I think it's really interesting to, to then compare um, apples and apples, if you will, or apples and oranges. So, um, just a little bit about the Raton Basin. Uh, we are, again, Raton Basin, Southern Colorado, located within Los Angeles County. Um, that same map that you guys have been seeing throughout is here. Um, we, we operate out of the Purgatory River field and the formations that we produce are the Raton and Vermejo coal seams, as well as the Pierre Shale. Um, not, as, not as often the Pierre Shale, however, it has been a test formation uh, historically. The, res the resources that we produce are 99% pure methane gas and agri agricultural grade water, uh, which I think even, um, you know, just hearing Mr. Hannigan speak, um, sorry, um, hearing Mr. Hannigan speak regarding their resources and what they produce um, seems to tie in very, very well with that. Um, and then there's only three operators. I think this also sets us apart is that there's only three operators within the Raton Basin. Uh, Evergreen and ourselves, obviously. Wapiti, who has operations both in the Colorado and New Mexico side, as well as Ogres. So um, for the most part, this basin has always been three operators. Um, so kind of interesting. Um, all right, going forward. So as I said, the Raton Basin is split between Colorado and New Mexico. Uh, obviously, you guys are only interested in the Colorado side, but uh, it does extend uh, throughout New Mexico as well or into New Mexico. And so uh, it's really interesting that you'll see the geology differs uh, from the Colorado side to the New Mexico, New Mexico side. Uh, you can see where the different operators are on, for the most part, uh, operating. And then an interesting fact about Evergreen is that we, our operations surround two Colorado State Wildlife areas as well. So uh, those weren't really on the initial image, so I kind of put them in with some green circles, but uh, very interesting that, you know, you'll see elk and deer uh, sitting right on top of our wellheads. Uh, they, they, they can wander in and out of their state wildlife areas, as, you know, to, to well sites. So uh, it's very uniform, if you will. 
So uh, just going further into it, uh, the Raton Basin and just on the surface, I guess, how we're different. As I said earlier, we produce 99% pure methane gas and agricultural grade water only. Uh, we do not produce oil. We do not produce VOCs. Uh, the, there is no freshwater, freshwater aquifer in the basin. So uh, in reference to that new regulation that um, the DJ basin you know, is experiencing with covering of the Fox Hills, and we do not have those freshwater aquifer zones. Uh, we have shallow coals. So they're not necessarily the same coals that we produce out of. However, uh, landowners that drill water wells, they, that water is coming from shallow coal seams. You know, they're producing methane as a byproduct uh, of their water that they use for agricultural reasons. And as an operator, we produce water as a byproduct of the methane gas. So uh, there's only those two resources and depending on why the well was drilled, you're, you know, you're looking for different things within it, but it's only those two resources. Uh, and so because we produce that agricultural grade water, uh, CDPHE has permitted or allowed us to permit uh, several sur surface discharge points throughout the basin uh, where we can utilize our clean produced water for agricultural purposes and, and discharge that to surface where the elk and the deer um, and cow, uh, you know, landowners can utilize that water for, for purposes. So um, another difference is that our, we have very, very low pressures, less than 20 PSIG, shallow operations, roughly 2000 feet uh, TVD or um, total vertical depth. And then our location size is only average about half acre in size. So uh, we're looking at very, very minimal surface requirements and um, everything blends in, if you will. Actually, you can see in this photo across the Trinidad State Lake, uh, this outcrop, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but part where it goes you know, from the trees to the um, rock, that's actually a coal outcrop. So that is a shallow coal seam the outcrops to surface, um, and I'll show you more pictures of that, but we have that everywhere throughout Los Angeles County. Uh, and then just another big difference is uh, that our, or within the Raton Basin, there are th over 300 closed or abandoned coal mines. And within Evergreen's operations, there's over 50 of them. So, uh, you know, this area has historically been utilized, whether it's for coal mining or oil and gas production, and uh, you know that they're making the resources available in one way or, the, or another. So the water that we produce, as you guys can see here, you know we've got uh, wildlife of all sorts uh, utilizing the produced water. Um, the produced water that is from the Vermejo and the Raton coal seams, which is the formations we produce out of. I'll get to, get to those in a minute. Uh, is extremely unique. Uh, in that it is some of the highest quality produced water from any coal bed methane project worldwide. Uh, it is a luxury, I would think, to have in Colorado such clean water, especially since we don't have, you know, any water flowing into the state aside from snowfall. 85% uh, of Evergreen's produced water meets the agricultural standards of the 3,500 milligrams per liter TDS requirement, uh, which for our current production today equates to about 71.4 million gallons of water per month. Uh, right now we're only utilizing 50 of the 100% in which we could be utilizing 85% of it. Uh, so thereby do, it does, you know, it seems as though we're under utilizing this extremely valuable resource in Colorado. Um, and so therefore we've, Evergreen has been creating discussions uh, with fire departments for fire mitigation, uh, engineered wetlands with the CDPHE, and COGCC, uh, as well as wildlife preservation and enhancement projects with local, state, and federal organizations, um, such as you know, Purgatory Watershed Program, the BLM, uh, you know, we're, we're talking to everyone. You know, we just wanna make sure everyone knows that this resource is here, so. So uh, geology-wise, let's get into it a little bit. You guys have seen uh, the conventional resources that we have in the basin, right? The, the DJ, the peons. Um, so on this right side is the conventional and you can see the sand grains and then the you know, the pores are filled with gas 
and water, um, and then the production curves that, that come with those conventional wells where you're gonna have high gas production and low water. And as you actually produce the well and you see the life of the well continue, uh, an increase in water production can indicate that your, your methane reserves have been depleted or are becoming depleted. So it's an indicator to the operator that, hey, you know, let, we may have to go find something else. We may have to drill infill wells, whatever the solution is. And it's almost the exact opposite with uh, coal bed methane. So um, I don't know who all's on here and what y'all's background is, but I'm gonna take it really simple. Um, imagine like a brick house, right? Where you've got your bricks that are kind of uh, offset to one another. And in the middle of those bricks, you've got the mud, right? That, that holds those bricks together. So that mud is essentially your cleat system. Cleats is another word for natural fractures, right? And, and anything within those bricks or between those bricks is your cleat system and your, your natural fractures. Uh, coal bed methane is extremely naturally fractured, uh, more so than essentially any other type of formation that we could produce out of. Uh, and so in order for us to access the gas that's within those bricks or within those, uh, you know, within the coal seams, we've got to produce the stuff that's in the cleats, within those natural fractures. And so what you see in a coal bed methane well is extremely uh, high water production at the beginning. Because in order to get the gas out of this, the coal cleat or the coal seams, you have to reduce the pressure in the formation, get that water, get the free gas out. And then what you'll start to do is see a, the pressure differential will allow the gas from the coal seams to come out. So you're gonna see lower gas production at the beginning with higher gas production in the middle and higher water at the beginning and it will fall off as you lower that pressure. Is that kind of, hopefully that makes sense. Um, two very different production, um, if you will, uh, I guess decline curves in a way um, and they mean different things. So. Um, hopefully that helped just, you know, make it all, I don't know, relatable. Uh, so then going back on to the Raton Basin structure and stratigraphy maps. Uh, so we produce, well, let me start here. Uh, the Pierre Shale and the Trinidad Sandstone. So the Pierre Shale is this big yellow piece here. Uh, the Pierre Shale is actually one of the formations that was located in uh, Mr. Duncan's presentation between the Sussex and the Shannon formations. So you're seeing that that uh, formation continuity all the way from the DJ Basin down to the Raton Basin. However, uh, the Pierre Shale, ha we've attempted to produce from the Pierre Shale. Uh, previous operators have, not Evergreen currently. Uh, and it was never found to be economically viable, which makes sense as to why Mr. Duncan also didn't list it as a potential pay zone, right? We're, we're seeing very similar uh, features of that, of that shale here. Um, these, if, you know, when they were drilled, pier shale wells were drilled as horizontal, quote, deep wells. Deep is in quotes because it's all relative. Uh, they're still 4,000 feet deep as opposed to uh, the DJ basin depths that you're going to see. Uh, and the pier shale wells represent um, less than half a percent of Evergreen's operating wells today. So uh, it was a test test phase for the previous operator. And um, as of right now, Evergreen doesn't have plans to go back and pursue it, but you know, I can never speak for the future. Um, and so then right above that Pierre Shale in the dark green, you can see the Trinidad Sandstone. Uh, this is a formation that varies from 40 to 240 feet thickness, again, depending on if you're on the Colorado side or the New Mexico side, you're going to see very different uh, thicknesses of it. Um, it's interwoven with the lower Vermejo coal seams. So, and I think it's uh, in a few slides, but is actually braided um, into it. So it's uh, some of the best Vermejo coal seams are sitting right up against that Trinidad sandstone. But because the Trinidad sandstone has the poor water quality, it um, has a, a lot of water. So it's just gonna dilute your production. Um, 
we've tended to leave some of those coal seams behind in order to avoid bringing on that extra water production of lower quality of, um, you know, everything else that frankly can be avoided, right, by just leaving behind a few perforations. So uh, historically, that's what's been done in at least evergreen wells uh, in order to avoid, you know, having to, to deal with the extra water on load. And then also to note here, I guess, is that uh, the Niobrara in the orange, um, which you can kind of see up there at the top, um, and then the Dakota sandstone, which you can see it at also at the top, you know, right next to it. Uh, that's the only pieces of those Dakota and uh, Niobrara formations from the DJ that you would see down here, right? Everything else is going to be very different. So those two formations kind of fade out. So um, getting further into the coal and gas characteristics and the geology of it, and um, I by no means want to talk over over your head, so I'm going to try to explain it as it would I would love it explained to me. Um, the coal formations that we see in the Raton and the Vermejo formations are moderate ash, low sulfur, um, high volatile A to B bitumous rank coal. So essentially, what this means is that uh, the bitumous rank determines the victorinite reflectance, don't worry about it, uh, which determines if the formation has reached its gas generation phase. So is it good quality coal? Will it produce methane gas yet? It just essentially determines the quality of the coal that you're sitting at right now, or that's being, you know, produced right now. So um, very, very good quality coal essentially is what that means. Um, coal bed methane gas being produced from the Raton Basin was thermally rather than biologically generated, thereby making it a renewable energy source. So uh, thermal generation of gas means that the methane produced is it's produced through the breakup of organic matter because that's how all uh, fossil fuels are produced is breakup of organic matter, but it really requires that elevated temperature and pressure in deep sedimentary strata. So as long as we have the deep or the, the high temperatures and the high pressures, which uh, we do in the Raton Basin, we will continue to have the generation of coal bed methane or methane gas. Uh, the biologic generation is the methane produced from biological degradation. So plants and animals, uh, you know, degrading, creating methane gas. Typically not what we see in the Raton Basin, but uh, definitely seen throughout Colorado. So um, the gas contents range from 250 to 450 in the Vermejo and uh, slightly less than that of 130 to 360 for the Raton. And then the permeability uh, ranges from three to 30 millidarcies throughout the basin. So you'll see some fluctuations, especially um, within, again, New Mexico and Colorado. We're as, um, it was pointed out in Mr. Andrews, I believe, presentation. Uh, the Raton Basin is completely surrounded by uplifts on every side of it. We got the Spanish Peaks to the north, the uh, Sangre de Cristo Mountains to the west, um, and Cimarron, New Mexico to the south. So um, with that, we've got a lot of, of changing features throughout the basin. Uh, so as I was mentioning earlier, uh, this is just another stratigraphic map, shows the uh, vertical stratigraphy in the Raton Basin, along with the geological attributes developed upon formation of you know, each of these various formations. Um, that Pierre Shale is one at the bottom there um, that again, we've attempted, don't find it economically viable right now. And then I guess most important is at the Raton, at the, at the semi-top, um, I, I mentioned earlier that shallow water wells were drilled into coal seams, just not our, you know, the same formation that we're producing out of, or I should say the same coal seams we're producing out of. Um, and you can actually see that, uh, not while it's not to scale, uh, from the Raton coals all the way essentially to the top, um, you've got coal seams, right? This, this gray, black, white that's representing the coal seams, um, that's all the way to surface essentially. So. Um, and I'll show you guys some pictures of that here shortly. Uh, so the Raton formation, 
um, it can be divided into four subtypes. Uh, the upper coal zone is a lenticular coal bed, uh, which tends to have greater thickness than the lower coal zones. Um, the middle barren series, which ranges from 165 to 600 feet thick, uh, merges with the Poison Canyon formation to the west. So that's where, we, that's where you'll see some of those outcrops coming to surface. Uh, the lower coal zone is around 100 to 300 feet thick. And then the basal conglomerate, which is actually eroded and braided into that ver uh, Vermejo formation, is roughly only 10 to 30 feet thick. So, and then this picture here is uh, actually of the Spanish peaks taken from a well site in our, in our field, so. Uh, the Vermejo formation is uh, a, the other coal bearing formation, which immediately overlies the Trinidad sandstone. So this is the one where I said, you know, we, we would give up a few perforations, a few coal seams to uh, ensure that, you know, we're not connecting to that Trinidad sandstone. Um, and then the thinning of the Vermejo to the east of the basin is again where you'll see some outcrops. Um, it actually, Vermejo Park Ranch, which is in Wapiti's operational area, um, is, is beautiful right on the Colorado, New Mexico border. Uh, you can see some great uh, outcrops there as well. Um, the, the Vermejo formation averages around 350 feet across the basin. Um, and being that the Vermejo formation, I guess, contains some of the thickest coals, not all of it, it was one of the first identified coal seams to be uh, researched and developed and mined in the area. So his, this formation has historically been the major completion target uh, for, you know, all the way through mining days. So pre even oil and gas, this was the formation that they were mining along the eastern edge. So, and going into our operation cycle. So um, phase one drilling, you know, it's very similar to everything you'll see in oil and gas essentially in that it's drilling, cementing, completions, and then production. Uh, however, the biggest difference here is that um, it takes us well, this is an old diagram. Uh, Evergreen and its predecessor have not actually drilled in the basin since 2014. Uh, and as of right now, there are no plans to do that. Uh, I'm not saying again, can't speak for the future, but uh, as of 2014, it was taking 12 to 15 days for the entire drilling completion and production process. Um, when you compare that to um, Alec Duncan, or Mr. Duncan, what he you know, presented for Oxy, where it was taking in 2011, 18 days to drill, their well, to drill their wells alone, right? And so it's because it's much shallower, um, you can get things done a lot quicker. Uh, in addition, um, operations both in the drilling, cementing, completions and production phases, over 90% of those have been done with in-house resources. So we've been able to ensure both Evergreen and its pre predecessor have been able to ensure quality control at every level, um, and that also sets us apart. So uh, drilling, 99% um, of our wells, as I've said earlier, are vertical wells drilled into the Vermejo and the Raton formations. Uh, typically, the wells are always drilled down to the top of the Pierre shale, and then they're cased and cemented to bottom. Uh, this allows for, you know, the insured protection of shallow groundwater uh, found in coal seams um, while allowing the coal bed formations to be completed together, therefore commingling the wells. Um, the techniques used to drill the wells is also slightly different. Um, this is used, or the process used in coal bed methane formations uh, is air drilling, typically because uh, with the low reservoir pressures and the, the cleat system that I was discussing, like the bricks system that I was talking about earlier, they're extremely susceptible to uh, invasion of drilling fluids and swelling. And so in order to avoid that, uh, you know, air drilling is one of the best techniques that's been found. Um, and then, as I said earlier, uh, no drilling operations in Evergreen's portion of the field since 2014. And this, this picture is actually from right before in 2013. Um, and then there are completions operations. So uh, the return coals require additional completion methods to reach economic levels of production. 
the base volumes from Evergreen recompletion jobs performed in 2020, so just last year, were less than half a percent of an average Weld County completion. So uh, essentially what we're doing is we're using nitro nitrogen and nitrified foam to uh, as the main carrying fluid in our jobs and that for therefore it reduces the water volumes that we're having to use uh, in in our jobs and so making it a uh, much more efficient and uh, you know they they roughly take three days um, and then also uh, we utilize 100 percent produced water due to the excellent water quality there's no need for us to go and and source clean water to use we have it uh, and then just the last little topic is these outcrops that I've been mentioning, you know, time and time again throughout this. Um, the coal outcrops from the Raton, the Ramejo, and shallower coal seams can be seen. This is taken right off of Highway 12. So anyone coming to visit, uh, you would drive right past this. Um, these natural, so these coal outcrops have natural volumes of methane gas that are being released to the atmosphere. Uh, and the COGCC has performed studies on these uh, seepage points, I guess you would call them, uh, in 2001, 2007, and 2015. And in addition to that, so within those studies, it was found that uh, the methane seep concentration due to the methane capture that Evergreen does, right, by, by capturing that methane, putting it into a pipeline and selling it, we've been able to reduce the methane emissions in, you know, over these 53 some odd seep, seepage points uh, by 93% uh, between 2001 and 2007. And then from 2007 to 2015, that methane seepage was reduced another 4%. Um, so we would, we would say that, I guess we are, we've reduced the average or we've reduced the methane seepage to atmosphere and the greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 97% in this basin. Um, an an in-house study that was performed earlier this year showed that 73% of the original seeps that were detected in 2001 by COGCC were found to have completely disappeared as well. So um, just a little fun fact. And that's all I have. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, Commissioner Bogue has a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a quick question from me, uh, Ms. Smith. Can you remind me who your primary consumers are of the methane that you produce? Yes, uh, that's actually, thank you for reminding me. Uh, what we do is we boost our methane gas into uh, CIG, which is a Colorado Interstate Gas Pipeline. Uh, and from there, it's taken out, you know, it's used for electricity, it's used for heat generation, uh, it's, you know, it can essentially be used for um, petroleum, you know, generation as well, but most often it is uh, heat and electricity. Great, thanks. That's all I had, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Bogue. Uh, Ms. Smith, um, you, you noted a couple of times that you've not drilled since 2014. Yes. Um, yes. So are you just, you have the existing wells, the existing production and evergreen natural resources is from a business perspective, that's a good place to be. There's not a need to do further development. Um, yeah. Are you going back in and re-stimulating any of the older wells that are there or is it just pretty much you've got things turned on and you're just leaving it as is? Man, I wish, but maybe I wouldn't have a job then. Uh, so, we are not currently drilling uh, and nothing has been drilled since 2014 in that uh, there's always a, an option, right? We would always love to go back and have a reason to drill more wells, but with gas prices the way that they are, um, economically, that's gonna be tough, uh, you know, for any operator right now, given prices. Um, that being said though, uh, we are always looking to continue utilizing the resources that have not been utilized yet uh, within our well bores. So um, any chance that we can to, to increase the gas production from wells, whether that's putting new pumps in, um, you know, in, uh, 
better utilization of where the water is going so that we can increase the gas production, right? Because we've got to get that water off to produce the gas. Uh, we continue to evaluate that, you know, as many of those options as we can. At the standstill for the last seven years has pretty much been gas prices. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, looking to my fellow commissioners, do we have questions? And thank you for the excellent presentation. It's a, this has really been a great um, presentation about the various basins and plays and whatever the other words are throughout the state. And yours is important and we don't pay as much attention probably because there's not as much activity going on. But I do appreciate um, your presentation today. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, as I said earlier, I recognize several faces from, you know, the Senate Bill 181 um, discussions that we have had and uh, appreciate you guys asking us to be part of this because it is so different. Um, it's hard to be looked at as, you know, just, just clogged in with everyone else, right? Because it is so different. Yeah. And, you know, I guess I would just sort of note for the record that in our discussion on mission change, when we were talking about pits, um, your company and the local governments down in that area brought to our attention the vital and necessary use of the water that was agriculturally permissible. Right. And, you know, I note that in Rule 909, we did create an exemption um, that allows for content. So all pits are being phased out across the state, except for ones within your Rotan Basin. Um, and there's also an opportunity to in, that those pits can be via a director determination, not fenced for wildlife. And so I had a discussion recently with the Los Animas County Commissioners about that. And I just wanted to put that out that, you know, that's one indicia of this commission working with its stakeholders to try to understand that, that Colorado topography, geology, water, et cetera, it's distinct depending upon where you're standing. And I, I think we did a pretty good job of recognizing that um, for the agricultural residents down there in, in, in that neck of the woods. Yeah, uh, I, I know that Evergreen surely appreciates, appreciates it. And uh, we've gotten feedback from landowners that they, they feel as if their voices were heard in that instance as well. So thank you. Sorry, I'm dominating commissioners. Does anybody else have questions or comments? All right, great. Uh, thank you again, Ms. Smith, for the presentation. Uh, stakeholders, you can, there's a link in our chat box to get to it if you desire to do so. And then we will finish up this morning's industry panel information with yet another presentation from a different neck of the woods, Christy Zeller with the Executive Director for the Energy Council in Southwest Colorado will now present to us. Forward to hearing from you, Ms. Zeller. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see your slide uh, without notes. So I think you're in good Great. Space. I'm getting an assist from some of your staff with the slides today. So I'm Christy Zeller. I'm the executive director of the Energy Council. Um, I've had this job for almost 20 years in July. So um, we promote responsible natural gas development, primarily a little bit of oil. Obviously, I represent Dolores and Montezuma counties as well, so CO2 and a little bit of oil over there. Uh, next slide. So you've seen all the maps. Um, so I just wanted to have a big blow up of the San Juan Basin. Uh, the San Juan Basin is um, primarily in New Mexico as Dave Andrews uh, educated you all on today. A Little bit of it is in Archuleta County and La Plata County. Uh, next slide. So this is a snapshot of where our wells are located in the San Juan Basin. If you look at that pink um, line that is kind of like a bowl shape, part of a bowl there, that part is actually um, the outcrop, just like what you learned about in Ev from Evergreen's presentation. So everything south of the outcrop is in the San Juan Basin and any of the red dots in the north of that pink outcrop and to the west is the Paradox Basin, um, also known as the Red Mesa Field. 
So inside of the pink is San Juan Basin, known as the Ignacio Blanco field. Outside of the pink is Red Mesa, known as the Red Mesa field. Next slide. So what I wanted to do is talk a little bit more about comparisons um, to the counties. From an efficiency standpoint, um, we produce the most natural gas in the state of Colorado with the least amount of wells. Um, years ago, we produced the most natural gas, but as um, these other basins have started looking for oil, some of the byproduct has been natural gas, so we lost our first place position. But we have about 2,800 producing wells, about 283 shut-in wells. And just to let you know, about two-thirds of those 2,800 wells are coal bed methane wells. And the other third are conventional gas wells with um, what we call heavier hydrocarbons or uh, natural gas liquids. 12% of the total natural gas produced in the state of Colorado comes from La Plata County and 78% of the state's CBM production comes from La Plata County. So Weld County actually produces the most natural gas, about 50% of it is um, from Weld County. Um, they obviously produce the most oil in the state with about 86, 87%. And they have about 10,899 producing wells, about 5,237 shut-in wells. Um, Garfield County is in second place with the state for the natural gas production with about 22%. Um, they have about 11,000 producing wells and 525 shut-in wells. And then Los Animas County produces about 2% of the total state natural gas and about 18% of that is CBM production with about 2,600 producing wells. So our geology is uh, very different down here. Um, our spacing is very different down here. And um, I'm really grateful for this educational opportunity for all of you. Next slide, please. So we have a pretty big history of development here. Um, we have probably in the 1940s, those are some of the earliest oil and gas leases. Um, I've seen some of the First wells were in the early 1950s. Um, the San Juan Basin is about 22,000 square miles in both Colorado and New Mexico. But those conventional plays were in two formations, basically the Mesa Verde formation and the Dakota formations. And then in the San Juan Basin, when coal bed methane development in the Fruitland Coal Formation began, it was um, kind of late 70s, but primarily in the, in the 1980s. And uh, what we think is coming next is a formation that has never been tapped into before. It's the Mancus Shale. And so I put a coming soon with a question mark. And then the little offset there is the history of the Red Mesa slash uh, Paradox Basin, a long history of conventional oil and gas production I think they discovered 1924 in the Paradox Basin. Uh, that's about a 33,000 square mile uh, Paradox Basin size. It's in two or three states. Um, also, just for your information, um, La Plata County is known as the, you know, we have the second most orphan wells in the state, um, but it's in the Red Mesa field in the Paradox Basin and not in the San Juan Basin Ignacio Blanco field. So um, I have an ask actually one of these days to when the reports are created, if we could somehow put La Plata County as the county, but suggesting using fields or basins so that you know, we don't all get painted with, um, we have an orphan well problem in the Ignacio Blanco field, for instance. Next slide, please. So this is just a snapshot of what I talked about earlier, but we are very unique in terms of coal bed methane. Only seven counties out of all the counties in Colorado produce coal bed methane. Um, La Plata County obviously has the highest production. Los Animas is right behind us, Archuleta is behind them. Garfield has a little bit, Rio Blanco has a little bit, Mesa has a little bit, Gunnison has a little bit. So um, when we say we're different too, our products are different and we're also unique to only seven counties. Next slide, please. So here is what I wanted to actually um, talk a little bit about is some considerations that we'd like um, 
you to know about in terms of the plugging and abandonment. You know, if we were prematurely asked by the COGCC to plug and abandon some of our older wells, um, what I wanted you to understand is that we have, you can sever the well, the minerals from the surface, but you can also sever formations. So one operator would own part of a formation, another operator could own another part of a formation. So these 1940s and 1950s wells, they're, they're really not at the end of their life. Um, they're still producing in what we call paying quantities. Um, when we're able to have a well that is producing and paying quantities, it holds an oil and gas lease, and we call that held by production. So the gist is a 70-year-old conventional Mesa Verde well in the San Juan Basin, it may have low production, but the leases are still an asset for not only the operator in a certain formation, but it's also important for the development of potential future formations. So we can go to the next slide because I think um, I'm a visual learner, but if you look at this slide, the Fruitland Coal is about the fifth formation down here on that slide. So example is operator X. They own the formations from the surface of the earth to the base of the Fruitland formation, for instance. So operator X, all of their wells are in that area. They could also own um, other formations in different sections that would include the Mesa Verde and the Dakota. But in some areas of our county, the formation has been severed. So like a conventional operator, we'll call that operator B, they may have no Fruitland formation at all, so no CBM wells at all, but only the conventional wells. So those are the ones with the heavier hydrocarbons, um, butane, propane. So um, those formations can be severed. And my hope is that you all understand that we may have a 1947 lease being held by production in a conventional Mesa Verde formation, but it has hope for the future development of a formation that is not currently being produced. Next slide. This is just another one of those pictures showing you the CBM um, in the middle of the basin in Colorado side. Um, that depth is about 2,500 feet. Um, a conventional Mesa Verde might be around 3,000 feet. Uh, potential Manka shell may be around 5,700 feet. And the Dakota can be anywhere from 7 to 9,000, but in the middle it's about 7,800 feet deep. Next slide, please. So your COGCC definition of a wildcat exploratory well means any well drilled beyond the known producing limits of a pool. So I wanted to um, talk a little bit about wildcat wells. Um, they truly are exploratory. Um, in some cases, they're also very risky because what you're looking for, you may not find. Um, for a wildcat well, spacing and setbacks to protect correlative rights are all prescribed by the COGCC rules and typically the order. Um, I reviewed several orders and they usually seem to be in the 535 series for an order. Um, drilling deviated wells is really becoming more common even here, even though we have a lot of vertical wells. Um, most recently, we're, we're definitely doing deviated drilling wells. And um, I looked at the COGCC permits with uh, what your status code is called XX, which is a location. And it appears though currently right now you have about 699 wildcat wells in the state. And in the almost 20 years that I've been here, we had one wildcat well. It was in the western side. Uh, it was a Niobrara exploratory well. The application link is for you, um, but it was not successful. So 
many millions of dollars spent and the operator tried but um, was not being uh, successful. Next slide, please. So one of my talking points usually down here is uh, San Juan Basin is the gift that keeps giving because we have been in consistent operation coexisting with our landowners and various operators. Um, but we do have formations that have not yet been drilled. Um, if we do have a formation that is never been drilled, it would be a wildcat well. Um, what we're hearing right now is if we had a wildcat well in the Manka shell formation and it was successful, that we'll actually be able to see, you know, the potential offset of our natural decline of how, how much MCF we produce out of this basin. And then if we were successful, then we had about six wells per year, we could actually see an incline. So when people say we're declining and the basin's done, um, I strongly disagree. Um, there's a lot of hope that, you know, successful uh, Manco Shell wells on the New Mexico side could also be successful here on the Colorado side in both La Plata County and potentially Ar Archuleta County as well. Next slide. So this is um, a slide that I borrowed. It's what we call about the evolution of development. And you can sort of ignore the ones on the right, but that conventional vertical well, the one that's to the left on the top row, that was primarily not only what our conventional wells were doing, but all of our initial 1980s wells were also conventionally drilled um, straight like that. And as time and evolution has happened, we have more of a wine rack or a multilateral um, horizontal wells that are staying inside that formation. And um, we do not have to hydraulically fracture any of these multilateral horizontal wells at all. And I constantly review frac focus just to see how many total hydraulic fracturing we're doing in this county. And um, we didn't frack anything in 2020. We haven't fracked anything in 2021. We fracked two wells in 2019 and 23 wells in 2018. So we're very different. Um, even the amount of water we use to frack a well for CBM and or going back in and enhancing a well it's somewhere around oh, 96,000 gallons to 120,000 gallons. So I always like to use that as a talking point because you hear about these millions of gallons, not that it wouldn't happen, but historically that, that's our water use as well. Next slide is for you to ask me any questions you may have. Commissioner McGowan, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Zeller. Um, so I, I was under the impression, and maybe it's a mistaken impression, that there wasn't a whole lot of new activity in your area. So when you say that there was some fracking done, is it, is it refracking of an existing well, or is, are there actually new wells being drilled? Ms. Zeller, you're, you're muted. Sorry about that. It would be refracking of an existing well, and it would be either a conventional or a coal bed methane well, maybe from the 80s. Um, we have had some new wells drilled um, in an area called the Tiffany unit, and those have been in the last maybe two to three years. And those did not need to be hydraulically fractured at all. Um, we do have some permits for wells. We had a spacing order in April of 2000. So there are opportunities to put a fourth well on a pad here for CBM, for instance. So uh, price is one reason why we're not seeing a lot of activity, but, but we still have some. Other questions from commissioners? Uh, 
Okay, I'm not seeing anybody up oh, right there at the close of the bell, Commissioner Rick Najapa. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you so much, Ms. Zeller, for the presentation. Um, I just want to get a little bit of clarification on something um, that you mentioned. Let me see if I can find the sled, the slide. <laughs> um, I think it was, yeah, okay. It was um, maybe the fourth or fifth to the last or sixth to the last slide that was about La Plata County and, and plugging and abandonment um, considerations. And um, you probably mentioned this before, but I may have, I may have missed it. I, I, I know you, when you showed the map and you, um, you know, we're talking about kind of where the area was, um, I, I, I'm assuming that there is, this is an area that has federal land and these are federal leases, or if you, could you just go a little bit further into the um, discussion that you were mentioning with respect to the leases and the, um, the intents of drilling into other formations and, and you know, what you were saying related to uh, if, if those wells were plugged and abandoned or if there was a, a need to do that um, or request to do that, how that affects the leases. I think I just want to make sure I was clear on what you were saying there. Okay, so that particular slide, um, what I was trying to help you understand is that we have operators that have severed the formations. So it may have nothing to do with federal acres at all. It would be that slice of the earth showing that operator a only owns and could only drill in the formations in which they have a leasehold. That's what we call that. And then another operator may have a Mesa Verde well in the same section, maybe even on the same pad, but they can only produce from the Mesa Verde formation. And so if you said that operator B, because it has low production, you deem it end of life, you're actually taking away what we would call that leasehold, where the leases now would expire if there's no well holding them. And that's why we want them to be able to be on the books in case we go into a new formation. And then I don't know who's running my slideshow, but Mimi, if you would go back to the slideshow that had the outcrop, um, it might help you with a visualization as well. So it's about the, maybe the fourth slide from my memory. Yeah, um, the next one with all the red dots and pink. So I know uh, Commissioner Robbins knows exactly where our Ute line is, but for you all, um, if you can see the green road on the most northern part that goes pretty much horizontal to some of our township section lines there, it's almost the middle of the slide. That would be known as what's called Highway 160. And just a couple of uh, small sections below that, that line that has some irregular shaped townships ranges instead of 36 sections, they sometimes have anywhere from 12 to 18. That's the Ute line. So everything south of the Ute line is or has the potential of having, you know, minerals owned by the tribe. Um, so we do have some very different jurisdiction and mineral ownerships here. Um, we also have about 6,000 local mineral owners here as well. Does that answer your question? I, I think so. Um, yeah, I just, I, and maybe, um, I, maybe I just need to read through this a, a little bit further and uh, with the, you've got extensive notes in here and, uh, and maybe follow up with you separately, but, um, uh, yeah, I just was trying to, I mean, I think I understand just based on what you explained with the different operators holding leases that are pertaining to certain formations, but 
that there may be interest in other formations and um, I guess maybe the one thing you could clarify for me. So if it's, if you've got um, operator A that maybe has an interest in, in one formation but has not yet drilled um, and then you have the operator B that is is producing from, in your example, the Mesa Verde for foundation or uh, formation, but is maybe producing at a low rate. Um, I think you said that those were sometimes on the same pad. And I, could you just, uh, sorry, could you just kind of um, give me a little bit further explanation of how these two operators are, are operating in the same area or where, you know, are there two different wells already? Or are you saying it's, it's an interest that is shared by the two operators? I'm just trying to better understand that. Sure. So um, let's pretend you're a mineral owner from 1946. Um, one operator came and took an oil and gas lease from you. And then as time moved forward, that operator drilled a well in the Dakota formation. And then as time moved forward again, another operator came in and talked to that first operator and said, can we buy the formation from the surface to the fruitland since you're producing in the Mesa Verde. And they make a deal and they sever the formation from that area that used to be owned by the operator from the surface all the way down to the center of the earth. Then that 1946 lease is still held by production. So the operator that buys the surface to the base of the fruitland, they can drill a well. And that lease is now, that royalty owner is getting paid not only by a Mesa Verde well or a Dakota well, but now a coal bed methane well. So if there is different spacing and our Dakota and Mesa Verde is 640 acre spacing and our coal bed methane is 320 acre spacing, then if you ended up severing or plugging and abandoning a well that wasn't capable of holding all of the lease acreage, maybe the lease was 2,000 acres that you gave, we could end up with um, the inability to pursue other formations. And if I'm not completely clear, I'm sure Commissioner Gonzalez can help as well um, with his landman background. But what I'm trying to show you is that we have an asset with a lease that can hold all the formations depending upon what leasehold operator it is. So operator A, B, or C, or even X. So those formations are severed. One of the things with our April of 2000 infill order for here is order 112-156, 112-157, is we agreed to do some pad sharing so to decrease the surface impact with roads, pipelines, and or equipment, um, many newer coal bed methane wells are now on the same pad as where that first coal bed methane well was drilled, which might also be on the same pad where there's a Mesa Verde well in some instances. So it can be very challenging when we have a corrective action with an inspection because we have three operators on one well pad if that makes sense. Thank you, that, that helps a lot to clarify kind of the situation that you're describing. Um, I, I definitely will um, either follow up with you or Commissioner Gonzalez, as you suggested, and, and just try to understand this a little bit better, but that's a, it's, it seems like a fairly unique situation with the pad sharing, et cetera, that um, as you described, but uh, thanks for helping me better understand. Sure. We also, just to let you know, we have a local land use code um, that Commissioner Robbins is familiar with. It was formed about 1988. It's been rewritten about 22 times, but in that as well as our memorandums of understanding with the county, we agree to pad share as well. And there's only a few exceptions or variances that are allowed for us to um, not be on the same pad. So we have a pretty long history of um, pad sharing compared to others. Also in that 112, 156 and 112, 157 was the first water well testing programs. And we have the most robust data in the United States down here. We've been water well testing since um, April of 2000. 
before it became a rule or before it became voluntary. So we have tens of thousands of water wells tested as well around where all those little red dots are. Um, and that data is uh, very good to have because it, it helps us with realtors and surface owners to understand that you know, we're, we're testing water wells, we're double case, double cemented, and we're protecting your drinking water from your water well because we don't have a lot of, um, we're, we're more rural, we don't have a lot of public waters. So um, the same thing, it's an, it's an assurance for the, the, the public. Other questions? Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Seller, for the presentation. Uh, we appreciate it. And um, I think with that, we are through with our industry panel information presentation on Geology 101. Um, this time we have commissioner comments. Um, does any commissioner have comments before we take our break and go into our scheduled executive session? Commissioner Hackett. Thank you, Chair Robbins. I wanted to make a brief comment about air quality monitoring in the Suncor community. Um, and this is also related, I, I believe Patricia Nelson is still participating with us today, but it's also related to her request for additional CDPHE monitoring um, at the Bella Romero Academy in Greeley. And, and Ms. Nelson, if you are listening, I'm certainly more than happy to keep the conversation going with you if you wanna reach out directly to me on that. But um, concerning Suncor, just wanted to make sure folks are aware and I'm a little nervous to say this because I'm getting out ahead of a press release right now. So my communications director, I can only hear her cringing right now. Um, but our plan and our hope is for us to send the camel to the Suncor community as early as this Friday, um, possibly sooner if possible. We've been coordinating with our local government partners at the city of Commerce City, Denver, as well as the South Adams County Water and Sanitation District to secure monitoring locations. Um, I, so hopefully we'll be sending the camel there by the end of this week. Staff is working diligently to prep that. Um, other staff is working on translating materials so, into Spanish so that the community um, can be informed in the appropriate language about what our activities are all of that data, of course, is going to be published online eventually. Um, and I understand that this monitoring is, is very much overdue. Um, I understand that it's a step in the right direction, but it's, it's long overdue. Um, I understand that we have a long way to go at CDPHE as well as, as the state more broadly to be more responsive to community concerns and grow our, grow our monitoring resources, um, provide more access, more timely access to data. Um, but this is one piece of that effort. Um, wanted to make sure people were aware. Um, and if you, I think a lot of the public commenters this morning who routinely provide comments to COGCC um, are also participating in the air division processes and the air quality control commission processes. So hopefully they're aware of this information as well. But if there are other members of the public um, who are still with us today or, or commissioners who aren't aware, CDPHE does have a um, a website that's just dedicated to issues in the Commerce City, North Denver area. It has all of the information from the Suncor permitting process. And I do believe this is where ultimately the air quality monitoring data that's being collected will be published. Um, that website is cdphe.colorado.gov forward slash cc dash nd. And that's cc for Commerce City dash nd for North Denver. Um, and so hopefully, in addition to publishing information about the CAMELS monitoring there, um, we're going to be sending out emails, text, text notifications to the community to, to spread the word about that. Um, and then also related to this, just wanted to say, you know, I for one am appreciative of all the efforts of um, individuals like Re Rene Millard Chacon and the group Cultivando to also get community um, led monitoring in that, um, in that area to help fill the gaps where CDPHE hasn't been able to monitor. So um, just wanted to provide that information and uh, be on the lookout for hopefully some, some press on that in the next couple of days. Thank you, Commissioner Hackett for that update. Other comments from commissioners? 
All right, seeing none, um, I will call on uh, AAG Davenport for our next steps. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioners, you're well versed in this process now. I have a short script to read for executive session, and then we'll need a motion. Pursuant to open meetings law, the commission is entitled to enter into executive session at this regular meeting for the purpose of discussing legal advice pursuant to Colorado Revised Statute 246402 3A Roman 2. The topic for this executive session was identified on the agenda. It is to receive legal advice and analysis regarding the implementation of Rule 502 variances. Mr. Chair, I invite you to encourage a motion to enter into executive session. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, uh, to our stakeholders and those listening in with us, we will now exit this Zoom meeting and we'll go into our executive session Zoom meeting. Uh, after we're done with executive session, we'll come back to this Zoom meeting to adjourn. Um, I'm giving you a heads up. We're not planning on taking any additional action today. No, we just did our, our last agenda item, which was commissioner comments. So you're happy to stay on the Zoom and watch us come back in an hour or so, and then we'll adjourn. Um, or if you want to gain an hour in your day, you can not participate further and you won't miss anything. Um, so with that, um, I will look to see all of you in just a bit. Do, do you want to take like 10 minutes? I, I'd like to get some lunch. <laughs> um, and maybe we can come back at, uh, say, um, say, say 115. That's 15 minutes. That'll give everybody time to get a sandwich or something in the other Zoom meeting. All right, okay. looks like we're all here. Go ahead, AAG Minor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we are now returning from executive session. During the executive session, the commission received legal advice on the implementation of Rule 502 regarding variances. No decisions were made and no votes were taken. Mr. Chair, I invite you to encourage a motion to exit the executive session. Looking for a motion to exit executive session. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 But the motion carries. Uh, I believe we have got to the end of our agenda today. Um, does anybody have anything further for the good of the cause? Seeing none, I would look for a motion to adjourn. And I would note to the public that's still here, we're having a work session on Friday at 10. So motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Najapa, a second by Commissioner McGowan. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We are successfully adjourned. Bye, everybody. <laughs>